Our ambassador to the U.S. and former member of the Israeli Knesset, Michael Oren, joining me now. Uh, Michael, the timing is perfect here because I know you're still plugged in. You do have a number of sources. Uh, you talk directly to those that are making these moves here. Um, let me ask you, what will this expansion look like? What, what do you see happening tonight? Good evening, Kara. What's happening tonight is the ground invasion will get off the ground. It has to get off the ground. We're up against a number of clocks, not the least of which is that we have 360,000 reservists uh, mobilized. That's probably more reservists than there are in the entire U.S. military. And these are young people in their 20s and their 30s. They're away from their families, away from their jobs now for three whole weeks. Uh, the state simply can't sustain that for much longer. And there are other clocks. There are the clocks of the hostages, the clocks of uh, the humanitarian situation. In Gaza, Israel has to move. And uh, it will move shortly. I'm not going to give you the exact hour, but it'll move shortly. When that happens, we will advance as fast as we possibly can while preserving the lives of our soldiers. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old soldier myself. I've been in situations like this before. You're talking about the most nightmarish situation for any soldier. It's a, going into a built-up area that's heavily mined, heavily booby-trapped, but that's just the beginning of it. The major battleground is actually beneath the surface where uh, Hamas has dug dozens, perhaps hundreds of kilometers of tunnels and bunkers, which are also heavily mined, and our hostages are down there, 229 hostages. So you just can't like flood these tunnels. You can't throw in a match. It's not going to work. So you have to go into tunnel, tunnel, bunker, bunker. It's going to take time. And when it's over, I think the United States has made a, I think a, a, I'm not a spokesman for the government. I've maybe plugged in, but I'm not a spokesman. I think the United States has made a very a valid request to know what the end game is. And I think the end game is going to look something like this, demilitarization uh, of Gaza, the emplacement of a government, a ruling uh, situation where it is not uh, it's not dedicated to terror, it's dedicated to uh, developing the Gaza Strip. And by the way, the Gaza Strip is a very fertile area. When there were Israeli settlements there, they provided all the organic vegetables for the state of Israel. It's got a great coastline, a tremendous, tremendous potential there under the right government. And I would hope that the Israeli government will work to internationalize uh, the Gaza situation. So it won't be an Israeli problem, not even an Egyptian problem. Michael, Make Michael, let me jump in. Let me jump in. Sorry, it was taking me a while to get my mic up. You you just you just broke some news. You you just said that a ground invasion is going to happen. You're not giving the exact time, but you're saying it is going to happen tonight. So tell me what that is going tonight. to look like. No, not tonight. I think it's going to be underway. It's going to be under shortly because it's we have these clocks. And I think, yes, they're going to have to move in. And I think that uh, beyond that, uh, that any talk of a ceasefire, and another clock is the, the rising demands for a ceasefire, understand that a ceasefire for Israel means, and I'm not exaggerating, means death. It means Hamas gets away with murder, not just murder, with massacring 100, 1,400 Israeli citizens. It means that we can't restore our security to the south. Citizens can't go back. We have 300,000 displaced people. Uh, it means we lose our deterrence power in a region which is very hostile to us. And other powers like Iran, Hezbollah may take advantage of that. Uh, we can't have a ceasefire, so we have to move quickly. I can't tell you what's going to be tonight. I can't tell you what's going to be tomorrow morning, but, but it, it will but be. But it is going to happen. You say it is going to happen. Okay, so then let me ask you this, because the IDF said that they did reach out to 229 hostage families, uh, saying that they are expanding the ground activity. What did the IDF tell these hostage families? Do you know? I don't. I've been in touch with a number of town hostage families. I meet with two or three of them per day. Um, and yes, they expect the government to do everything possible to get them back. There were apparently, here I don't know, there were apparently some negotiations through Qatar that the Hamas, the government has concluded, and the military has concluded, that Hamas is just working to gain time. Uh, Hamas will release maybe one or two hostages uh, of very high profile nature that will uh, increase international pressure on Israel to accept that ceasefire. And that's an impossible will that happen situation. Before, uh, will that happen before a massive ground in, incursion? Will we see more hostages be released? I, would, I wouldn't doubt it. I don't know. I'm not a spokesman for Hamas. <laughs> I'm not. I don't know. Their, their, their modus operandi has been to re reduce, re to release a certain number of hostages that are high profile. They get headlines, and the, a, the demands for ceasefires will increase around the world. We can't do that. They're using this time to build up their defenses they're using this time to jack up whatever price they're going to have for these hostages. At the end of the day, they're going to use the hostages as human shields, just as they use the Palestinian population as human shields. Um, uh, our so, so, Michael, were these... I, 
Were these, family, were these families told, these hostage families told that there could be loss of life, that their loved one uh, may, may die in this incursion? No, they were told that the, the IDF will do everything possible, the state will do everything possible uh, to rescue them. And we have special forces that are trained to do precisely that. Uh, if Hamas were today to release all of the hostages uh, without condition in return for maybe even a small pause, uh, in the in our offensive, we would certainly agree to that. But Hamas is not going to agree to that. It's going to use them as human shields, and it, it's it, it added, that is the reality of what we're dealing with. Dealing with a evil, dark terrorist organization that rapes, burns, dismembers, beheads, and takes 229 uh, innocent people, including some 30 children, aged people, Holocaust survivors. That's what we're dealing with. Um, so, and Israel so has this to expansion. We have to. Look, let me, let me ask you about this expansion, okay, because it's out there now. The IDF is saying we are expanding ground operations, period. We're doing it tonight. So, so Kit, as much as you can, detail for me what that is going to look like. What does that mean, expanding operations? Well, expanding operations so far has meant, uh, first of all, uh, escalating the aerial bombardment, also ground and sea bombardment of Hamas positions uh, within Gaza. It's a softening up, if you will, of some of the battle areas in which our, our combat troops will be entering. Uh, it is trying to locate the tunnels. Now, I'll tell you honestly, this I can say, that they taking out a tunnel and a bunker uh, from the air or even by an artillery shell is very difficult. These tunnels go 30 feet below the ground. And we know from a fact that Hamas's main headquarters is situated underneath the major hospital in Gaza. Uh, and the Hamas is preventing civilians from leaving that hospital area by gunpoint. And there are an estimated 30,000 civilians that Hamas is basically holding hostage around the hospital. These are Palestinian hostages, not Israeli hostages. So this is how complicated can this get? It, it is immensely complicated. Any civilian casualties who are kept at gunpoint around that hospital, that is what Hamas is doing and not the state of Israel is doing. We've told these people to move away from the battle area as best as they can. Hamas is preventing them from leaving. How do you go? How do you go in and take out those tunnels? It's a it's a hard one. Um, we have units that are trained to do this. It's it's extremely hazardous duty. Their their levels of casualties are are much higher than even the paratroopers or other inter, infantry groups. Um, they have to go into the tunnels and uh, and and close them and ferret out. When they are cleared, they are blown up. Uh, and that has been our experience in previous rounds of fighting. Our, it's going to be immensely complicated to the presence of of our hostages. P.S. We actually don't know where they are. They could be in, in different places. Many of the hostages, uh, you should know, are not in the hands of Hamas. Hamas has indicated doesn't even know where all the hostages are. Uh, some are in the hands of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, the other terrorist group in Gaza, wholly armed and, armed and operated uh, by Iran. But some of them are in the hands of families. These are people who crossed the border with Hamas, took hostages and brought them back, and uh, at some point will sell them for a price. So let me ask you, Michael, what is the end game here? If indeed the IDF goes in, expands operations, dismantles uh, Hamas, who leads the Gaza people? I think you have to have a, a interim government least that has certainly Palestinian representation in it, but it could also have a representation from other Arab countries. I, I just think it's in Israel's interest, uh, I strongly believe that's interest, is to, to internationalize as much as possible the Gaza situation. So it's not just Israel's problem. It's not just Egypt's problem. And it's clearly just not Israel's problem, Egypt's problems, because you can see what this conflict has done to the entire region. And now even the United States moving major na naval assets to the region, all because of Gaza, because of Hamas. So that situation But is that plan in place, Michael? Is that plan in place? I'm, I hope it is. <laughs> I certainly have been talking about it for a long time. And by the way, the question about endgame has come up in virtually every round of fighting. I remember in 2014, during the Protection Edge issue, the, the same came up again. And our endgame, unfortunately, didn't work. Our endgame was to uh, say something like, quiet for quiet. Thomas kept quiet. We kept quiet. We let an immense amount of Qatari cash uh, flow into the lap of Hamas. We let 20,000 Gazan workers come in every day to Israel at great risk. Uh, and we thought that Hamas would prefer stability. Uh, we thought that Hamas would prefer uh, sort of progressing, advancing the, the quality of life of the citizens of Gaza. No, Hamas is about one thing and one thing only, and that's killing us. And you know, the, the, there may be fuel shortages in Gaza, but there's no fuel shortages 
for Hamas. Tonight we had a, on the Israeli news, there was a, a recording of Hamas commanders talking about how they have a, a half a million uh, gallons of fuel uh, underground and they have no problem. So there's no problem with electricity, no problem with water, no problem with food. Uh, they don't care about their own citizens. I, if so, I have time, I'll tell you that for about a year that, I was in charge by the Israeli government, made me in charge of Gaza. You don't, you don't want this job. And what I learned in that year, I didn't learn in, in 20 years of university, and that is that everything you know about human decency, everything you know about civilization, when it comes to Hamas, throw it out the window. They don't care. They're about death. So one more question. I want to bring in our James Longman, who's there on the ground. If Hamas uh, is dismantled, like the IDF says it, it, it plans to do, then how do you how do you prevent another group of terrorists, a terrorist cell, to intimidate the Palestinian people who don't support uh, terrorists, who don't support Hamas? How do you prevent uh, the same thing from, from happening again, or a rise in power from another group of terrorists? There's nothing foolproof about this. Hamas is the same thing as ISIS, the same thing as Al-Qaeda, the same thing as Hezbollah. They have exactly the same theology. It's to take over the Middle East, transform it into a a caliphate, and then expand its borders to include the entire globe. It, Hamas just seems to wants to destroy the state of Israel as the first step in that process. They're exactly the same. You can't destroy the idea of these organizations, of these terrorist organizations. What you can do is down is degrade them. So when you take out ISIS today, ISIS is still a threat, but it's not the threat that it was in 2017. Uh, you can say the same thing about uh, there are lots of neo Nazis around today, but they don't have the power now that James Nazi Germany doesn't questions. exist. You can degrade them. And you can reduce that threat and make it manageable, hopefully, by an international or inter-Arab force. Michael, stay with us, please. We are talking with Israel's uh, former ambassador to the U.S. and former member of the Israeli Knesset, also member of the IDF as well, Michael Oren. Stay with us. We're going to take a quick break. We want to bring our James Longman there in Tel Aviv into this discussion as well. If you're just tuning in, uh, expanding ground operations taking place in Gaza tonight. That's coming straight from the IDF. 229 hostage families have been alerted. We've got more news right after this quick break. Whenever news breaks... The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the storm. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back to our breaking news coverage. I'm Kira Phillips. If you are just tuning in, the IDF uh, spokesperson, spokesperson rather for the Israeli Defense Forces is now telling us that tonight it has expanded ground operations into Gaza, saying that Israel will be, quote, acting with great force 
to achieve the objectives of war. Also, the IDF going on to tell us that they did alert the 229 hostage families that they would be expanding ground operations tonight. We want to continue our breaking news coverage and bring into the conversation our foreign correspondent, James Longman, who's there in Tel Aviv, who has been following this uh, from the very beginning of the, the, the war that has taken place against Hamas, which began on October 7th. Our Inez de la Quatera also joining us uh, from Jerusalem. And also Michael Oren, Israel's former ambassador to the U.S. and former member of the Israeli Knesset, uh, a part of our conversation as well. James, uh, what exactly are you hearing uh, at this hour? Well, uh, I've just spoken to a family, one of the hostages. This is Al Mogmer, 21-year-old, uh, who was taken from the festival. Uh, his uncle, he and, he and I have been speaking today, he said to me that he has not been alerted by the uh, Israeli authorities, that he did have a conversation with an official today. But that was simply to invite him and his family to a meeting on Monday at the foreign ministry. But he was not alerted about an expanded ground operation by the Israeli authorities. I can't speak to the families of the other hostages. We have haven't spoken to all of them, uh, but that does seem to contradict what the IDF said in that statement about alerting uh, families of the hostages. It may be that that is an ongoing process uh, and they are reaching out to them. There are a lot of them after all. And we know that the communication between the Israeli uh, authorities and uh, the IDF, uh, uh, sorry, the Israeli authorities and the families of the hostages hasn't been as clear or as quick as many of them would have liked. So perhaps this is an ongoing process and he will be contacted. But I can tell you now that Aviram just spoken to me a few moments ago and has confirmed that he has not heard from uh, the authorities. This is an incredibly worrying time for those families. Uh, they have put on a lot of pressure on the government the last three weeks to try to stop them from this ground incursion, expanded ground operation, whatever we're calling this tonight, uh, because they wanted a focus on their loved ones. Uh, if tonight is the beginning of something bigger for them, it will be a night uh, to really, really worry. Uh, but uh, we, should, uh, we should kind of really, really make clear that we don't know that this is a larger ground operation, the incursion we've all been talking about. It may be that it's just the beginning of that, um, uh, and we'll have to wait and see what exactly does happen. But we've certainly been looking at the situation in Gaza uh, over the course of the day, and it's been getting progressively worse. More than 7,000 people, according to the Hamas health authorities, have been killed in ongoing bombardments. The United Nations put out a statistic saying something like 40% of the buildings in Gaza are now no longer livable. Uh, there, there is no fuel. Uh, limited water, limited food, it has been sealed off. And in the last hour, we also heard that telecommunications have now been cut. So uh, internet and phone lines. We have been speaking to people in Gaza for the last three weeks, trying to hear from them what they're experiencing. Uh, and now that is no longer possible at this point. Is that related to what the Israelis are, are currently are doing now in the south, mounting this military operation? It's very unclear. It could be that uh, telecommunications lines have just be been damaged by the ongoing bombardment, or there could be another issue. But We've heard from both the telecommunications company and the Palestinian uh, Internet, uh, Committee, the Red Cross, that they are now no longer able uh, to communicate with people uh, inside Gaza. So a worrying time for the people of Gaza uh, and a worrying time for the families of those hostages as they look on to see whether, in fact, uh, Israel is about to launch its ground incursion. Kira. Michael Oren, let me let me get you then to respond uh, to, to what James just said with regard to comms being cut here. Also, the fact that uh, James actually spoke directly with a hostage family who said, indeed, he was not contacted by the IDF. The IDF is saying that they, the spokesperson said they reached out to the 229 hostage families. So what's the deal here? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And uh, families are big. And they may have spoken to certain members of those families, not spoken to the person that James spoken to. Uh, I don't know. I, I know I meet with families. When I meet with families, I meet with uncles and cousins, uh, fathers, mothers, brothers. Uh, it's big. I don't know. Um, and then, you know, frankly, speaking frankly, maybe the government, the, the army hadn't made that statement, shouldn't have made that statement before the, the hostage families were uh, contacted. I don't know. But what I do know is that, uh, Kira, we're in a war. And this war began on October 7th when thousands of Hamas terrorists, by the way, accompanied by no small amount of Gazan citizens who just participated in this rampage, um, murdered, burned, mutilated, raped, uh, beheaded, uh, immolated, uh, 1,400 Israelis. Uh, that's why this has happened. You can't forget that. Uh, Israel itself is still very much sort of embedded in October 7th. We hear these stories are coming out one after another. Um, they are 
just simply unbearable. Many members of the press were shown a 43 minute tape that was taken from the body camps of the terrorists who were later killed, showing what they did to these families. And it, the, the most extraordinary thing is that they, they were proud of this. They actually wanted to broadcast it. Many of these films were then uploaded on Facebook of these families so they could see how their loved ones were, were dissected, were, were, were mutilated. That's what this is. It is a war. And we cannot, cannot accept a ceasefire. And we have to remove the Hamas threat from our borders or this country simply. And I say this as guardedly as I can. This country simply cannot survive. All right, let me bring in our Mick Mulroy, our, our national security and defense analyst. He's on the line now. With your experience, uh, Mick, especially uh, within in the Middle East as CIA and also uh, Assistant Secretary for Defense, the fact that James just reported, you know, comms have been cut off, phone lines have been cut. We've got the IDF saying they're expanding ground operations in Gaza right now. Uh, apparently, uh, the IDF said uh, 229 hostage families had been contacted about this, but as you heard from James, not every. Uh, family member has been contacted. So what is just from your experience, what's your take right now on what's about to happen or is happening at this moment? So Kara, I think we're seeing the transition between the shaping phase of their uh, operation into the execution in a, in a ground assault phase. In the shaping phase, we saw limited uh, rage to target specific uh, entities, likely command and control coming from the ground and the sea. Uh, we saw airstrikes also probably against uh, command and control leadership and to soften the targets up, essentially. And now we're moving into what it looks like and certainly indicated by cutting the power, cutting the communications, et cetera, looking into a larger, uh, a larger phase of the ground operation in which they will start moving in major forces into the area. And they don't want them to be able to communicate. All right, Mick, Inez, Michael, James, thank you all so much. I'm Kira Phillips. We will continue following this breaking news. The IDF announcing ground operations expanding right now in Gaza. 229 hostage families, according to the IDF, have been alerted to this. We'll be right back. More news on the other side. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Halloween morning, someone somewhere in America is going to get one incredible surprise when GMA knocks on their door live and gives them VIP tickets to a Monday night football game of their dreams. See the surprise happen live Tuesday on Good Morning America. GMA next week. Wake up with Jennifer Garner cooking things up. The best deals and steals on Oprah's favorite things. New Kids on the Block, Cheryl Crow, and some mad, scary fun Halloween surprises. Halloween morning on GMA. ABC News, America's number one news source. And hello, everyone. We begin with breaking news now. An Israeli Defense Forces spokesperson telling us that tonight the IDF is expanding ground operations in Gaza, saying Israel will be, quote, acting with great force to achieve the objectives of the war. I want to bring in our foreign correspondent, James Longman, in Tel Aviv. James, what more are you hearing now about the expanding operations in Gaza tonight? Well, in the last few minutes, the IDF have confirmed that they are expanding ground operations. It, I should make clear, it doesn't sound like an incursion. That's not the word that they're using. Uh, so uh, what exactly this looks like remains unclear at this point, but they have said that they've informed uh, the families of the hostages that they are going ahead uh, with this. But I want to bring in now ABC's Inez de la Katara. She joins now uh, from Jerusalem. Inez, uh, what does this all say uh, about the timing of this looming full-blown ground in Invasion. I mean, is this it, or is this all that Israel was ever going to do? 
Yeah, that's the big question here, James. This does appear to be Israel laying the groundwork here for this big uh, ground operation. But this is, at the moment, it does appear to be uh, still limited ground incursions. So they are saying they're going to be stepping up their ground operations. And this comes as they're also saying that they're going to be very significantly escalating their airstrikes on Gaza, this uh, latest wave, possibly the, the heaviest wave of airstrikes we've seen since this all began. And we have seen a number of limited incursions into Gaza in recent days, just over night there were uh, limited incursions including by sea um, and there are questions as to whether like you say this could be the IDF maybe changing changing its strategy here because of the hostages as they're trying to get more hostages released they might be shying away at least for now from that full-scale uh, ground invasion and instead focusing on these limited raids so uh, we'll have to see what happens there uh, we're, we're also you know this this also comes as we've been hearing reports that a ceasefire could be in the works the Israeli side those shooting that down earlier today saying it's not an option for them that they're not going to be negotiating with Hamas uh, asking the rhetorical question would you negotiate with Isis um, and some more breaking news out of Gaza with uh, reports that communications have now been shut down no phone no internet we're waiting for more information on that uh, but we've of course been relying so heavily on people inside Gaza to share with the world what is happening and if those uh, communications have gone down that would be uh, terrible terrible news for Gaza. And what is the latest on what was happening in Gaza? I mean, when was the last time you spoke to someone inside or saw reports of what was happening uh, inside? Uh, clearly, people there now, if they have been sealed off, if there's no communications, uh, they don't know that something's coming. Uh, but this, the humanitarian situation there, incredibly serious. That's right. Yeah, I mean, the no communications, reports of no communications would be on top of this the siege that the IDF is is conducting. No food, no water, no electricity, no fuel. Uh, we were at a UN briefing earlier today specifically uh, to, to get more answers on this issue of fuel. We know they're in dire need of fuel, that hospitals, bakeries, water stations rely on fuel, and they are running out. Hospitals on the brink of collapse. Um, there are a few different things going on when it comes to fuel. So we understand that the uh, UN has its own reserve, but that is quickly dwindling. The UN today also uh, revealing that there is uh, a, another kind of reserve that, that that was, this is fuel that was brought into Gaza prior to October 7th under a deal brokered by Israel and Qatar that uh, the UN is now trying to gain access to, but they're uh, waiting for what they say is deconfliction, which essentially would be Israel agreeing to stop uh, targeting that area so that UN workers can get in and out safely. Um, and then there are, of course, reports that Hamas has uh, close to half a million liters of fuel. The UN could not confirm that. They said they have no idea what Hamas may or may not have uh, in Gaza. And of course, no fuel has entered Gaza since October 7th. Ines de la Quetara, thank you. I want to go now to Louis Martinez, uh, the Pentagon. Louis, we heard that the, the United States had told Israel that they wanted to get their assets into place. They set conditions before any expanded military operation took place. Can we then assume that the U.S. has put those military assets in place? Is there any sense from the Pentagon if, that they know what's going on here? James, one thing we should point out is that when we are talking about U.S. military assets, we're not talking about them going into Israel. We're talking about them going into the broader Middle East. The United States has several large military bases uh, in several countries there in the region. And what they've done is they have increased their presence, some air defense systems. We know that they've sent the... Uh, aircraft carriers, one to the eastern Mediterranean. They, the other one is en route towards uh, the Persian Gulf, probably, uh, all to deter Iran. And yes, we have been getting a play-by-play -play here, depending on that, as these units have gotten their orders, particularly those air defense units, we have been told that they are either in the process of deploying or that they have are arrived, and that very quickly they would have their systems ready to go in place. Now, we don't have an exact timeline, but we are aware that, yes, the suggestion has been made to the Israelis of uh, that they should uh, potentially wait for that to happen. But again, when we talk to many U.S. military officials and defense officials here at the Pentagon, they all know, look, this is an Israeli operation. They have the clock. This is their own clock. Um, and it is essentially they are the ones that are going to determine when is the best time for them uh, to carry out operations. Now, with the Israeli Defense Forces spokesman going out there and saying that they are expanding their uh, ground operations, it remains unclear to us exactly what that means. We can 
kind of go back to yes, they've undertaken these limited ground incursions over the last couple of nights, but then they've retreated back across the border. The question now becomes is, do they, are they undertaking something similar, but instead of retreating, they remain in place? That's, uh, that's just speculation on our part, but uh, when it comes to the movement of U.S. forces, um, they don't all necessarily have to be in place. Sometimes the deterrence can just work by, by announcing that you are going to send uh, military equipment or personnel into a region. Um, that's how deterrence works. Deterrence also means that you just don't send uh, personnel and equipment to a region. You also may potentially use it, and that's exactly what happened last night when we found out about those two airstrikes against those two facilities that were, tar that were targeted because they held munitions that have been used by Iranian-backed militias that have been used to target U.S. bases inside of Iraq and Syria. Louis, Inez in Jerusalem, thanks. Kira, back to you. Okay, James, thanks so much. As we continue to follow this breaking news, the IDF now expanding ground operations in Gaza, even alerting 229 hostage families about this expansion. The world still wanting to know what happens after Hamas is dismantled, and if indeed it is. What is Israel's endgame if its military machine wipes out these terrorists and the political power that they maintain in Gaza? Israel's former ambassador to the U.S. and former member of the Israeli Knesset, Michael Oren, joining me now. Uh, Michael, the timing is perfect here because I know you're still plugged in. You do have a number of sources. Uh, you talk directly to those that are making these moves here. Um, let me ask you, what will this expansion look like? What, what do you see happening tonight? Good evening, Kara. What's happening tonight is the ground invasion will get off the ground. It has to get off the ground. We're up against a number of clocks, not the least of which is that we have 360,000 reservists uh, mobilized. That's probably more reservists than there are in the entire U.S. military. And these are young people in their 20s and their 30s. They're away from their families, away from their jobs now for three whole weeks. Uh, the state simply can't sustain that for much longer. And there are other clocks. There are the clocks of the hostages, the clocks of uh, the humanitarian situation. In Gaza, Israel has to move, and uh, it will move shortly. I'm not going to give you the exact hour, but it'll move shortly. When that happens, we will advance as fast as we possibly can while preserving the lives of our soldiers. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old soldier myself. I've been in situations like this before. You're talking about the most nightmarish situation for any soldier. It's a, going into a built-up area that's heavily mined, heavily booby-trapped, but that's just the beginning of it. The major battleground is actually beneath the surface where uh, Hamas has dug dozens, perhaps hundreds of kilometers of tunnels and bunkers, which are also heavily mined, and our hostages are down there, 229 hostages. So you just can't like flood these tunnels. You can't throw in a match. It's not gonna work. So you have to go into tunnel, tunnel, bunker, bunker. It's gonna take time. And when it's over, I think the United States has made a, I think a, a, I'm not a spokesman for the government. I've maybe plugged in, but I'm not a spokesman. I think the United States has made a very a valid request to know what the end game is. And I think the end game is going to look something like this, demilitarization uh, of Gaza, the emplacement of a government, a ruling uh, situation where it is not uh, it's not dedicated to terror, it's dedicated to uh, developing the Gaza Strip. And by the way, the Gaza Strip is a very fertile area. When there were Israeli settlements there, they provided all the organic vegetables for the state of Israel. It's got a great coastline, a tremendous, tremendous potential there under the right government. And I would hope that the Israeli government will work to internationalize. Uh, the Gaza situation. So it won't be an Israeli problem, not even an Egyptian problem. Michael, Make Michael, let me jump in. Let me jump in. Sorry, it was taking me a while to get my mic up. You, you just, you just broke some news. You, you just said that a ground invasion is going to happen. You're not giving the exact time, but you're saying it is going to happen tonight. So tell me what that is tonight, going to no, look. I did not tonight. I think it's going to be underway. It's going to be under shortly because it's, we have these clocks. And I think yes, they're going to have to move in. And I think that uh, beyond that. Uh, that any talk of a ceasefire, and another clock is the, the rising demands for a ceasefire, understand that a ceasefire for Israel means, and I'm not exaggerating, it means death. It means Hamas gets away with murder, not just murder, with massacring 100, 1,400 Israeli citizens. It means that we can't restore our security to the South. Citizens can't go back. We have 300,000 displaced people. Uh, it means we lose our deterrence power in a region which is very hostile to us. Uh, and other powers like Iran and Hezbollah may take advantage of that. Uh, we can't have a ceasefire, so we have to move quickly. I can't tell you what's going to be tonight. I can't tell you what's going to be tomorrow morning. 
but, but it, it will but be. But it is going to happen. You say it is going to happen. Okay, so then let me ask you this, because the IDF said that they did reach out to 229 hostage families, uh, saying that they are expanding the ground activity. What did the IDF tell these hostage families? Do you know? I don't. I've been in touch with a number of town hostage families. I meet with two or three of them per day. Um, and yes, they expect the government to do everything possible to get them back. There were apparently, here I don't know, there were apparently some negotiations through Qatar that the Hamas, the government has concluded, and the military has concluded, that Hamas is just working to gain time. Uh, Hamas will release maybe one or two hostages uh, of very high profile nature that will uh, increase international pressure on Israel to accept that ceasefire. And that's an impossible will that situation. Happen before, uh, will that happen before a massive ground in, incursion? Will we see more hostages be released? I, would, I wouldn't doubt it. I don't know. I'm not a spoken for Hamas. <laughs> I'm not. I don't know. Their, their, their modus operandi has been to re reduce, re to release a certain number of hostages that are high profile. They get headlines and the, a, the demands for ceasefires will increase around the world. We can't do that. They're using this time to build up their defenses. They're using this time to jack up whatever price they're going to have for these hostages. At the end of the day, they're going to use the hostages as human shields, just as they use the Palestinian population as human shields. Um, uh, our so, so, Michael, were these, I, were, these family, were these families told, these hostage families told that there could be loss of life, that their loved one uh, may, may die in this incursion? No, they were told that the, the IDF will do everything possible, the state will do everything possible, uh, to rescue them. And we have special forces that are trained to do precisely that. Uh, if Hamas were today to release all of the hostages uh, without condition in return for maybe even a small pause uh, in, the, in our offensive, we would certainly agree to that. But Hamas is not going to agree to that. It's going to use them as human shields. And it, it's, it, it added, that is the reality of what we're dealing with, dealing with a evil, dark terrorist organization that rapes, burns, dismembers, beheads, and takes 229 uh, innocent people, including some 30 children, aged people, Holocaust survivors. That's what we're dealing with. Um, so, and so has this to expansion. Let me, let me ask you about this expansion, okay, because it's out there now. The IDF is saying we are expanding ground operations, period. We're doing it tonight. So, so can, as much as you can, detail for me what that is going to look like. What does that mean, expanding operations? Well, expanding operations so far has meant, uh, first of all, uh, escalating the aerial bombardment, also ground and sea bombardment of Hamas positions uh, within Gaza. It's a softening up, if you will, of some of the battle areas in which our, our combat troops will be entering. Uh, it is trying to locate the tunnels. Now, I'll tell you honestly, this I can say, that they're taking out a tunnel in a bunker uh, from the air or even by an artillery shell is very difficult. These tunnels go 30 feet below the ground. And we know from a fact that Hamas's main headquarters is situated underneath the major hospital in Gaza. Uh, and the Hamas is preventing civilians from leaving that hospital area by gunpoint. And there are estimated 30,000 civilians that Hamas is basically holding hostage around the hospital. These are Palestinian hostages, not Israeli hostages. So this is how complicated can this get? It, it is immensely complicated. Any civilian casualties who are kept at gunpoint around that hospital, that is what Hamas is doing and not the state of Israel is doing. We've told these people to move away from the battle area as best as they can. Hamas is preventing them from leaving. How do you go? How do you go in and take out those tunnels? It's a it's a hard one. Um, we have units that are trained to do this. It's it's extremely hazardous duty. Their their levels of casualties are are much higher than even the paratroopers or other inter, infantry groups. Um, they have to go into the tunnels and uh, and and close them and ferret out. When they are cleared, they are blown up. Uh, and that has been our experience in previous rounds of fighting. Our, it's going to be immensely complicated to the presence of of our hostages. P.S. We actually don't know where they are. They could be in, in different places. Many of the hostages, uh, Perry, you should know, are not in the hands of Hamas. Hamas has indicated doesn't even know where all the hostages are. Uh, some are in the hands of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, the other terrorist group in Gaza, wholly owned and armed and operated uh, by Iran. But some of them are in the hands of families. These are people who crossed the border with Hamas, took hostages and brought them back, and uh, at some point will sell them for a price. So let me ask you, Michael, what is the end game here? If indeed the IDF goes in, expands operations, dismantles uh, Hamas, who leads the Gaza people? 
I think you have to have a, a interim government at least that has certainly Palestinian representation in it, but it could also have a representation from other Arab countries. I, I just think it's in Israel's interest, I uh, strongly believe that's interest. This is to, to internationalize as much as possible the Gaza situation. So it's not just Israel's problem. It's not just Egypt's problem. And it's clearly just not Israel's problem, Egypt's problems, because you can see what this conflict has done to the entire region. And now even the United States moving major na naval assets to the region all because of Gaza, because of Hamas. So that situation But is that plan in place, Michael? Is that plan in place? I am I hope it is. <laughs> I certainly have been talking about it for a long time. And by the way, the question about endgame has come up in virtually every round of fighting. I remember in 2014, uh, during the Protection Edge uh, issue, the, the say came up again. And our endgame, unfortunately, didn't work. Our endgame was to uh, say something like, quiet for quiet. Hamas kept quiet, we kept quiet. We let an immense amount of Qatari cash uh, flow into the lap of Hamas. We let 20,000 Gazan workers come in every day to Israel at great risk. Uh, and we thought that Hamas would prefer stability. Uh, we thought that Hamas would prefer uh, sort of progressing, advancing the, the quality of life of the citizens of Gaza. No, Hamas is about one thing and one thing only, and that's killing us. And you know, the, the, there may be fuel shortages in Gaza, but there's no fuel shortages for Hamas. Tonight we had a, on the Israeli news, there was a, a recording of Hamas commanders talking about how they have a, a half a million uh, gallons of fuel uh, underground and they have no problem. So there's no problem with electricity, no problem with water, no problem with food. Uh, they don't care about their own citizens. I, I, if so, I have time, I'll tell you that for about a year I was in charge by the Israeli government, made me in charge of Gaza. You don't, you don't want this job. And what I learned in that year, I didn't learn in, in 20 years of university, and that is that everything you know about human decency, everything you know about civilization, when it comes to Hamas, throw it out the window. They don't care. They're about death. So one more question. I want to bring in our James Longman, who's there on the ground. If Hamas uh, is dismantled, like the IDF says it, it, it plans to do, then how do you, how do you prevent another group of terrorists, a terrorist cell, to intimidate the Palestinian people who don't support uh, terrorists, who don't support Hamas? How do you prevent uh, the same thing from, from happening again, or a rise in power from another group of terrorists? There's nothing foolproof about this. Hamas is the same thing as ISIS, the same thing as Al-Qaeda, the uh, same thing as Hezbollah. They have exactly the same theology. It's to take over the Middle East, transform it into a a caliphate and then expand its borders to include the entire globe. It, Hamas just seems to wants to destroy the state of Israel as the first step in that process. They're exactly the same. You can't destroy the idea of these organizations, of these terrorist organizations. What you can do is down is degrade them. So when you take out ISIS today, ISIS is still a threat, but it's not the threat that it was in 2017. Uh, you can say the same thing about uh, there are lots of neo Nazis around today, but they don't have the power now that Nazi Germany doesn't questions. exist. You can degrade them. And you can reduce that threat and make it manageable, hopefully, by an international or inter-Arab force. Michael, stay with us, please. We are talking with Israel's uh, former ambassador to the U.S. and former member of the Israeli Knesset, also member of the IDF as well, Michael Oren. Stay with us. We're going to take a quick break. We want to bring our James Longman there in Tel Aviv into this discussion as well. If you're just tuning in, uh, expanding ground operations taking place in Gaza tonight. That's coming straight from the IDF. 229 hostage families have been alerted. We've got more news right after this quick break. So I got a bunch of new pieces on Shein. 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 This company just seemed to come out of nowhere. Shein's tapping into our urge to consume and express ourselves. I spent $500 as Shein. Calling out a big company is scary. What makes Shein so different is the Unboxing Shein. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. And welcome back to our breaking news coverage. I'm Kira Phillips. If you are just tuning in, the IDF uh, spokesperson, spokesperson rather, for the Israeli Defense Forces is now telling us that tonight it has expanded ground operations into Gaza, saying that Israel will be, quote, acting with great force 
to achieve the objectives of war. Also, the IDF going on to tell us that they did alert the 229 hostage families that they would be expanding ground operations tonight. We want to continue our breaking news coverage and bring into the conversation our foreign correspondent, James Longman, who's there in Tel Aviv, who has been following this uh, from the very beginning of the, the, the war that has taken place against Hamas, which began on October 7th. Our Inez de la Quatera also joining us uh, from Jerusalem. And also Michael Oren, Israel's former ambassador to the U.S. and former member of the Israeli Knesset, uh, a part of our conversation as well. James, uh, what exactly are you hearing uh, at this hour? Well, uh, I've just spoken to a family of one of the hostages. This is Al Mogmer, 21-year-old, uh, who was taken from the festival. Uh, his uncle, he and, he and I have been speaking today, he said to me that he has not been alerted by the uh, Israeli authorities, that he did have a conversation with an official today. But that was simply to invite him and his family to a meeting on Monday at the foreign ministry. But he was not alerted about an expanded ground operation by the Israeli authorities. I can't speak to the families of the other hostages. We have haven't spoken to all of them, uh, but that does seem to contradict what the IDF said in that statement about alerting uh, families of the hostages. It may be that that is an ongoing process uh, and they are reaching out to them. There are a lot of them after all. And we know that the communication between the Israeli uh, authorities and uh, the IDF, uh, uh, sorry, the Israeli authorities and the families of the hostages hasn't been as clear or as quick as many of them would have liked. So perhaps this is an ongoing process and he will be contacted. But I can tell you now that Aviram just spoken to me a few moments ago and has confirmed that he has not heard from uh, the authorities. This is an incredibly worrying time for those families. Uh, they have put on a lot of pressure on the government the last three weeks to try to stop them from this ground incursion, expanded ground operation, whatever we're calling this tonight, uh, because they wanted a focus on their loved ones. Uh, if tonight is the beginning of something bigger for them, it will be a night uh, to really, really worry. Uh, but uh, we, should, uh, we should kind of really, really make clear that we don't know that this is a larger ground operation, the incursion we've all been talking about. It may be that it's just the beginning of that, um, uh, and we'll have to wait and see what exactly does happen. But we've certainly been looking at the situation in Gaza uh, over the course of the day, and it's been getting progressively worse. More than 7,000 people, according to Hamas health authorities, have been killed in ongoing bombardments. The United Nations put out a statistic saying something like 40% of the buildings in Gaza are now no longer livable. Uh, there, there is no fuel. Uh, limited water, limited food, it has been sealed off. And in the last hour, we also heard that telecommunications have now been cut. So uh, internet and phone lines, we have been speaking to people in Gaza for the last three weeks, trying to hear from them what they're experiencing. Uh, and now that is no longer possible at this point. Is that related to what the Israelis are, are currently are doing now in the south, mounting this military operation? It's very unclear. It could be that uh, telecommunications lines have just be been damaged by the ongoing bombardment, or there could be another issue. But We've heard from both the telecommunications company and the Palestinian uh, Internet, uh, Committee, the Red Cross, that they are now no longer able uh, to communicate with people uh, inside Gaza. So a worrying time for the people of Gaza uh, and a worrying time for the families of those hostages as they look on to see whether, in fact, uh, Israel is about to launch its ground incursion. Kira. Michael Oren, let me let me get you then to respond uh, to, to what James just said with regard to comms being cut here. Also, the fact that uh, James actually spoke directly with a hostage family who said, indeed, he was not contacted by the IDF. The IDF is saying that they, the spokesperson said they reached out to the 229 hostage families. So what's the deal here? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And uh, families are big. And they may have spoken to certain members of those families, not spoken to the person that James spoken to. Uh, I don't know. I, I know I meet with families. When I meet with families, I meet with uncles and cousins, uh, fathers, mothers, brothers. Uh, it's big. I don't know. Um, and then, you know, frankly, speaking frankly, maybe the government, the, the army hadn't made that statement, shouldn't have made that statement before the, the hostage families were uh, contacted. I don't know. But what I do know is that, uh, Kira, we're in a war. And this war began on October 7th when thousands of Hamas terrorists, by the way, accompanied by no small amount of Gazan citizens who just participated in this rampage, um, murdered, burned, mutilated, raped, uh, beheaded, uh, immolated, uh, 1,400 Israelis. Uh, that's why this has happened. You can't forget that. Uh, Israel itself is still very much sort of embedded in October 7th. We hear these stories are coming out one after another. Um, they are 
just simply unbearable. Many members of the press were shown a 43 minute tape that was taken from the body camps of the terrorists who were later killed, showing what they did to these families. And it, it, the most extraordinary thing is that they, they were proud of this. They actually wanted to broadcast it. Many of these films were then uploaded on Facebook of these families so they could see how their loved ones were, were dissected, were, were, were mutilated. That's what this is. It is a war. And we cannot, cannot accept a ceasefire. And we have to remove the Hamas threat from our borders or this country simply. And I say this as guardedly as I can. This country simply cannot survive. All right, let me bring in our Mick Mulroy, our, our national security and defense analyst. He's on the line now. With your experience, uh, Mick, especially uh, within in the Middle East as CIA and also uh, Assistant Secretary for Defense, the fact that James just reported, you know, comms have been cut off, phone lines have been cut. We've got the IDF saying they're expanding ground operations in Gaza right now. Uh, apparently, uh, the IDF said uh, 229 hostage families had been contacted about this, but as you heard from James, not every. Uh, family member has been contacted. So what is just from your experience, what's your take right now on what's about to happen or is happening at this moment? So Kara, I think we're seeing the transition between the shaping phase of their uh, operation into the execution in a, in a ground assault phase. In the shaping phase, we saw a limited uh, rage to target specific uh, entities, likely command and control coming from the ground and the sea. Uh, we saw airstrikes also probably against uh, command and control leadership and to soften the targets up, essentially. And now we're moving into what it looks like and certainly indicated by cutting the power, cutting the communication, et cetera, looking into a larger, uh, a larger phase of the ground operation in which they will start moving in major forces into the area. And they don't want them to be able to communicate. All right, Mick, Inez, Michael, James, thank you all so much. I'm Kira Phillips. We will continue following this breaking news. The IDF announcing ground operations expanding right now in Gaza. 229 hostage families, according to the IDF, have been alerted to this. We'll be right back. More news on the other side. Tonight, the victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. I got a bunch of new pieces on Shein. 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 This company just seemed to come out of nowhere. Shein's tapping into our urge to consume and express ourselves. I spent $500 as Shein. Calling out a big company is scary. What makes Shein so different is Unboxing Shein. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Traveling with the president in London, I'm Elizabeth Folsey. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Terry Moran, it's now 10 p.m. in Israel, and we begin with the breaking news from there. Israel is expanding ground operations inside Gaza. Those words come from a spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces, and we're also being told that the IDF 
has alerted hostage families about this incursion. But how many is still unclear. The IDF is also announcing that Israel will be, quote, acting with great force to achieve the objectives of the war, unquote. Starting us off, our foreign correspondent James Longman there in Tel Aviv. James, what do we know about what's happening right now tonight in Gaza at this hour? Well, it's a moving situation. About an hour ago, we had news that uh, all communications seem to have been cut with Gaza. That was from a communications company and the Palestinian Red Crescent said they couldn't get through to people in Gaza either. And then the IDF reported they uh, were expanding their ground operation, but it wasn't clear exactly uh, what that meant. Uh, but for more on this, uh, let's bring in Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel. I know details are thin at the moment, but Ian, what can you tell us uh, about what Israel is doing currently in the south of Israel? Israel. Yeah, OK, so first of all, let's look at what we actually know. We know that statement from the IDF that it's expanding operations in Gaza. Now, does this constitute an incursion or an invasion, which we know that the Israeli government was planning? Uh, we've heard that on the record from the prime minister. Uh, we won't know unless either the Israeli Defence Forces change their statement to say that's what it is. And on the record, they're certainly telling ABC News that it isn't the start of the invasion at the moment. Or when dawn comes tomorrow morning here in Israel, that those forces that have crossed over into Gaza are still there. Um, we saw what you would normally expect to be the precursors for a significant land operation. This, this intense bombardment, the severing of communications, at least internet outages, if not totally off. Uh, those would be all the things that you would expect to see on the ground. Um, they say that the hostage families have been contacted. I know that you've spoken to the family of one hostage who's, who cast doubt on that. The IDF, the Israeli government, certainly made it clear that they had contacted all of the family members. Earlier today, I spoke with uh, the defense minister um, uh, here in Israel, and we talked a lot about this. He talked about different phases of the war. He talked about phase one being, first of all, trying to make uh, Israel safe and secure. In other words, from the attacks that happened on October the 7th and, uh, and conducting these uh, sea, air and ground operations in Gaza. Uh, and then the next stage would then be the land operation. We were given a very clear impression that we were getting close towards the, the transition from one of those phases into the other. But clearly there are huge complications. There are complications, of course, because of the more than 220 hostages who are there on the ground. There's a lot of domestic pressure here in Israel from the families and supporters that those hostages be released beforehand. We know the United States is also applying some pressure and it wants Israel to moderate its war plans. We know that Qatar and other countries are actively involved in those negotiations. Uh, and you know, the longer this has gone on, the more pressure there is on Israel to modify, uh, if not totally change its plans, to try and assuage increasing criticism from the Allies. And Ian, a serious situation inside Gaza, obviously, for the last three weeks, but with this suggestion now that communications have been cut off, I mean, it must be truly terrifying inside Gaza Strip. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we're getting odd reports from, from some of the people who, 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 you know, are still in there, some of the reporters, some of the families that we've been able to kind of stay in touch with. Uh, but for most people, those lines of communications have been cut. Um, some of the images that seem to be emerging from inside Gaza it shows an incredibly heavy bombardment, possibly the heaviest bombardment since the, the start of this latest phase of the conflict in, on, on October 7th, after the Hamas massacre here in Israel. Um, so intense bombardment. Many civilians, of course, have been told to move down. Again, Defence Minister Gallant said they'd gone out of their way to tell civilians that there would be something uh, happening in the north of Gaza and that they should move to the south house <clears throat> but we also know many of those areas that they fled to uh, have also come under attack so I think for many people on the ground they simply feel that there is nowhere safe a and certainly for the people of Gaza after uh, you know so many days every day every night of this bombardment this latest round this prospect of a land incursion uh, for many people will be terrifying in panel thank you Kieran Terry back to you all right, James, thanks so much. And also joining us now as this news breaks is Avihai Brodich, whose wife and young children were actually abducted by Hamas back on October 7th. He has been desperately waiting to find out anything about their condition and or their whereabouts. He actually joins us here in D.C. Uh, in our bureau. Avihai, just 
in light of this breaking news, uh, let me ask you if, if you have heard anything today from the IDF about this expanding ground operation or, or anything about your family. No, I haven't. It's still the same news I have uh, since three weeks ago. Um, well, for me, nothing has changed. And uh, from this IDF, what's happening now, I just heard on the news. And <clears throat> Avi, if, if I may ask you, the, uh, our foreign correspondent we were just listening to, uh, Ian Panel, uh, mentioned a briefing that he had with the Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, uh, Gallant, who outlined the goals. Number one, destroy Hamas. Number two, return the hostages. Uh, I, this is your country and your family. And that is a, 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 a terrible place to be in a time of war. And I just wonder if you feel the hostages are at, including your loved ones, are being considered at the appropriate level. Are they the right, does the government have the right priority for your family? Well, if that's, that's what he said, then he's obviously got his priorities wrong. And uh, that's why I'm here, you know, to get the priorities right again. Uh, the hostages, you know, the, there are women and children over there, and children have definitely got nothing to do with it, along with the women. And uh, that's the first priority. It's obvious throughout, you know, throughout humanity. The children shouldn't be involved. They sh shouldn't be involved. They should be out of there right now. So we got to change these priorities right away. Abihai, as we look at pictures of your kids, uh, your wife, tell us about them, uh, please. Um, how old they are, their names. Just humanize your, your family for us since we haven't had the chance to meet them yet, and hopefully we will. Well, you know, I've known my wife for 22 years, since I was 20 years old. Uh, you know, Hagal, I love her very much. She's the love of my life. She does everything for me. I'm, you know, I, I look, you know, like, I look strong now, but I'm not, you know, deep inside, I'm lost. She's, 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 she's done everything for me throughout my life, and, you know, I just want her back so much. And, you know, <laughs> I sleep alone now. I really miss her. <laughs> so I really hope she'll be back soon. Um, she, you know, we have three beautiful children. Uh, my youngest, Uria, he's four and a half years old. You know, he, he likes to make a big mess in the house. He likes to play soccer inside the house, and break things and now I wish, I wish he was just there breaking things. Uh, my middle child, you know, my middle son Yuval, he's a very sensitive type so I have to say I'm really worried about him. Uh, so you know he plays Xbox a lot, I see kids here playing Xbox and you know I, I feel for him, <laughs> I'm really, you know, it's terrible just to see it and you know he likes playing soccer as well and he builds all these Legos all the time. And, you know, I just walked past the Lego shop and I wanted to buy him something, but, you know, I don't know where he is and how he's doing, so it was terrible. And my eldest, which is my little girl, <laughs> Ofri, uh, you know, she's just this beautiful girl and I miss her so much. I, I got a guitar, she, she left her, well, obviously, you know, her guitar is back home. I just got it from her, from the house. I asked someone to bring it to me. And every day I, I play her guitar and, you know, I think of her and, it's really terrible. She, she just celebrated her birthday. You know, on the day of, of the attack, we were meant to celebrate with her friends. And there's still cake in the fridge. I know that because the soldiers came, you know, the IDF came into my house just to see that they told me that they, were, they weren't there, they were, that no bodies were found. But they also opened the fridge and they saw the cake. And I just met with one of them a few days ago and he told me they all started crying when they, when they saw the cake and the candle on it and they knew what was going on. So, you know, it's just terrible. I, I miss them so much and I really want them to come back. And, you know, you were asking me before the priorities. This is obviously the first priority. They've done nothing wrong. My girl just wants to celebrate her birthday like all her friends. You know, my sons just want to play soccer. So that's obviously the first priority. Somebody's got something wrong in their minds. And Abihai, I just want to say you, you have a beautiful family. Hmm. You're blessed, thank clearly, you and we thank you for, for sharing that with, you, with us. And I want to ask you just one more question. You're here in Washington, D.C., to see what American policymakers here can do. They're deeply involved, obviously, since they're American hostages, too. What have you heard? What are you looking for from the American government, and uh, how, how have your meetings gone? You know, I just got this so much support. I, I think, you know, America is 
just this great nation. That, you, you know, I got so much support in Israel, but that's obvious. And I came over here, and I got so much support from the government and, you know, government officials, just everybody I met. People prayed for me this morning. You know, I was having my breakfast, and this lady came, and she says, she told me, I just want to pray for you. And she hugged us, you know, the whole team, and she just prayed for us, you know. The same with, with everyone, you know, the senators I met, and. You know, all the congressmen, they just gave me so much support and I really wish they could change, you know, the, the, the situation and bring my family back home to me. Avihai, I hope you stay in close touch with us um, because you remind us why we need to cover this story and why we need to talk to parents like you, your wife, your three kids. I know you're not giving up hope. Nobody um, is right now. And um, just stay, stay close with us as things uh, pick up here overseas. Uh, we will be doing everything we can to ca ha cover what's happening here, obviously, in the United States as well. Thank you, Avi. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. James, we'll take it back to you in Tel Aviv. Yeah, heartbreaking stories from the families who are waiting to, to hear about their loved ones who've been taken hostage, but also so many around the world worried for their loved ones. Gazans, Palestinians also stuck inside Gaza because it has been uh, sealed off and they can't get out. Most Gazans, of course, uh, are not Hamas militants. They are civilians uh, and they have been uh, trapped in the middle of this war for weeks now. Uh, several communications companies released statements just this evening saying all communications and internet services have been cut off following intense Israeli bombing. And I want to bring in now Jihad Abu Salim. He's a Palestinian scholar and policy analyst uh, from Gaza. He also grew up there. Uh, we saw earlier photographs of his childhood uh, inside Gaza. Jihad, thank you for joining us. We spoke only an hour or so ago, but since then we had this news that uh, the IDF have expanded this action in the south, whatever that means, and that uh, possibly communications have been cut off uh, to some parts of Gaza. Uh, can I ask? Who is there, uh, and uh, when was the last time you were able to speak with them? Um, I have lost contact with my family uh, three hours ago. Uh, no one is picking up, no one is answering the phone, no one is responding to my text messages. Um, there are very few reports that are coming out of Gaza. We were, were, were fortunate to have Al Jazeera covering uh, what's happening on the ground, uh, the bombardment uh, of the city. But even uh, Al Jazeera's team cannot uh, cover every aspect of uh, what's unfolding right now. Uh, based on what we're hearing, we're hearing that uh, the Gaza Strip now is under uh, an unprecedented level of bombardment uh, compared to the past few days. I mean, think about this relative to what we have witnessed so far, the mass destruction, the mass killing. Uh, the, the destruction of entire neighborhoods, entire towns, like the town of Beit Hanun in northern Gaza, completely destroyed. So when, when I hear now that my family, who I can't be in touch with, uh, my siblings, my father, my mother, that they are under this heavy bombardment, um, I, I, can, I cannot stop thinking about the words of a friend who just posted uh, on, on social media. He wrote... I am really afraid that the, that communication with Gaza will be restored, but there won't be anyone to answer on the other end. Yeah, that is that is a very startling, startling thought. And and, and you, of course, are trying to get through to your family, but your mother and father are there. Try just to to paint a picture of what it's like being in the United States, unable to contact them. Just explain what that's like. For you it's not easy it's not easy because you know here in the united states um you know you, you you're you're just hearing the news and waiting and and this this waiting is is very heavy it's um it it, it puts you in a very difficult situation just you know waiting for a notification uh for a text message calling um continuously to to make sure that your loved ones are alive this is not easy and uh, you know it, it's difficult to capture in words what that feels uh it's been almost 20 days now and uh, i can tell you um 
I've lost neighbors, I've lost friends, I've lost relatives, uh, entire homes that I used to um. pass by when, you know, growing up in, in, in the town of Deir el-Balah in the, in the middle of the Gaza Strip, no, neighborhoods okay. that I, you know, I have memories uh, attached to, they're all gone. So, you know, for, for every individual, for every Palestinian from Gaza who's abroad, who's, you know, who lives outside of the Gaza Strip, it is time passes in a, in a, in a heavy manner, just waiting for that piece of news that might be devastating or just being relieved every an hour, every one hour, every two hours, once someone picks up uh, on the other end and says, hey, we're alive. Um, and, and even that luxury of being able to check in on our families and make sure that they're still breathing, that they're okay, is something that we're deprived of now. We can't even, we can't even get through to, to our loved ones and make sure that they're alive. Uh, uh. Well, Jihad Abu Salim, thank you for speaking to us. And I think I speak for everyone when I say I really hope that you can speak to your family as soon as possible when connections are restored. Thank you. And Kira Terry, I'll throw it back to you in New York. James, thank you. So let's bring in our, our senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez, national security and defense analyst, Mick Mulroy. He's also the former deputy assistant and secretary of defense for the Middle East. Uh, and our contributor and retired U.S. Army general, General Robert Abrams, gentlemen, thank you. And General Abrams, if I can, if I can begin with you, we don't know exactly what it is that we're seeing out of the Israeli Defense Forces. It, it does obviously they're showing us some pictures, and we are getting reports that they, uh, this is more of uh, a raid or or any kind of probing. It seems like they are at least in Gaza, perhaps to stay. We'll find out later. But I just want you to talk for a minute. Something we've heard about, but from your perspective, the challenge of this operation. We just heard from hostages and from uh, a, a Palestinian whose family is in Gaza. The challenges for the Israeli Defense Forces to accomplish their objective, which is to destroy Hamas's capacity to attack Israel, with, with the complications of that dense urban environment and so many hostages. And, and, and I'd add uh, untold, you know, million plus uh, non-combatants in addition to the hostages also complicates it. Um, look, I, I don't want to overstate it, but it's it's almost mission impossible to keep all of those requirements in balance. Uh, um, the laws of armed conflict dictate how the IDF should conduct their operations, and, and they're doing it in an incredibly congested area. Uh, imagine 100,000 troops on the outskirts of Manhattan, uh, if you will. It's that level of density that we're talking about and distinguishing between combatants and non-combatants where you have Hamas, who is completely intertwined with civilian society, makes it almost mission impossible to accomplish those objectives and observe the laws of armed conflict. Mm. Not only mission impossible, but Mick, what about the end game? Let's say the IDF dismantles Hamas, goes in there and, and, and roots them out. Uh, then what? Who, who's in charge? Who, who runs Gaza? Who's the political party that everybody believes in? How do you prevent a resurgence? I mean, I'm having flashbacks of Iraq where, oh, there was this big mission accomplished, which definitely was not mission accomplished. They might have taken out Saddam Hussein, but then look what happened to the country and the people and the leadership. I mean, is there a, an, a plan here for if, if, if they indeed go in and dismantle Hamas? Do they have a plan for what happens after that? I Mick, you're... I don't know if you need to unmute, Mick. I think, yeah, unmute. Okay, start start from the beginning, Mick. Thank you. No, nope, still don't hear you. All right, we're gonna we're gonna keep working your audio, uh, Mick. General, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think it's it's um, you know that's a hypothetical, but I, I don't think the goal is dismantle. That's not what I've read. The IDF want to completely destroy, which is a much higher task than dismantling. And again, I, I think it's 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 virtually impossible um, because as as every five fighters die, it'll it'll spawn another 10 fighters. I mean, this is what we we the US military learned over 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So 
um, you know, it, it's it's not as simple as it sounds to quote eradicate or eliminate Hamas, especially in this sort of a, an environment. And and Mick Mick, I understand that that, that we can hear. And I want to take to you the this remarkable relationship, military to military, between uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, which have this assignment, this very difficult assignment. General Abrams has been been talking about, uh, and the U.S. military establishment. Secretary Defense Secretary Austin has been over there. Obviously, there's close coordination at the head of state level. What what is America? What has the United States been trying? Uh, to urge uh, Israel to do, and and how much influence can we have? Do you, how do you see that critical relationship for Israel and for the stability of that region working out at this point? So, Terry, to, to Kira's earlier question, I think one of the things the United States can do, and I was in Baghdad when, when Saddam fell, and we really didn't have a plan. So there's a lot of things that we can bring from our own experience. Not that we're superior, but we have already been through it. Not just with having a plan after the actual major combat operations in for a potential insurgency, which I think we will see here as well, and how are they going to deal with that, but also how to fight in urban terrain, You know, whether it's Mosul in 2016 or Fallujah, all these places that we've fought and, and learn so much, not only how to win, but also how to avoid civilian casualties. I think those are the things that the United States is trying to help the Israelis, the IDF specifically, deal with, both our expertise in, in conducting the operation, but also conducting it within the laws of armed conflict, like the general mentioned. Mm. And Louis, you reported not only about the, the expanding ground operation in, in Gaza tonight, but also the fact that the IDF reached out to, uh, they said, the spokesperson said 229 hostage families. We're not quite sure uh, how many uh, family members have been contacted. We've asked a couple that we know. They have not been contacted yet. Do you have any idea uh, what the families would have been told? Hmm. Kira, what we're told is that the, the families were notified essentially about the status of negotiations, uh, not necessarily about the ground operations themselves. Uh, what we are seeing now is the IDF essentially saying that they are expanding their ground operations, but we don't know the scope. We're don't not exactly sure exactly what that means. But we do have new reporting from Martha Raddatz, who has spoken to a senior U.S. official who has information that says that what we will be seeing from Israel is more of a limited incursion. Now, that is very different from that mass, massive invasion that we have been contemplating or expecting on the part of the Israeli Defense Forces. But maybe that's a part of exactly how they're going to describe it, as a limited incursion. Well, the other information that we have from the senior U.S. official is that they will also be pairing uh, this operation with the flow of humanitarian assistance. We know that we've been watching what's been going on there at the border inside with Egypt, um, and that the flow has been very limited. So it's unclear exactly how that flow will continue as Israel mounts up a larger incursion. Louis, Mick, General, thank you all so much, as usual. Appreciate it. Well, coming up, the urgent manhunt in Maine continues to grow, and we're learning more about the victims as well. Stay with us. Thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Glad you're streaming with us now uh, to that urgent manhunt taking place for the mass shooting suspect uh, 
in Lewiston, Maine, hundreds of law enforcement agents at this hour looking for 40-year-old Robert Card. Shelter-in-place order remaining in effect for several cities now surrounding that area. Police say nearby waterways, as you saw there, are now a major focus for them today. This after investigators say the suspect's car was found abandoned at a nearby boat dock. Robert Card is accused of killing 18 people, injuring 13 others in a shooting rampage on Wednesday night. Police say they have received more than 500 tips and leads in this case. Neighbors in the surrounding areas are understandably on edge with the shelter in place order still in place. That's right. We've got reporters covering all angles of the story, but we do take it to our Morgan Norwood, who uh, has been reporting since the very beginning on this. What are you learning at this hour, Morgan? Well, Kira, I can tell you we're starting to see our first signs of strength and resilience, especially as this community continues to reel after that horrific shooting here. You know, we talked about this earlier. This lockdown in some ways has really put the pause on the grieving process. No memorials, no vigils, um, no signs. But all of that just changed within the past few minutes when Alex McMahon, he's a local business owner who just placed a sign just outside the scene here. It's out of the frame, but we'll show it to you. Um, it says Lewiston Strong, um, and he wants it to be known as, a, you know, just a sign of strength strength and resilience and he wants the same for the city of Lewiston as well. Here's what he had to say about how he's doing and how he hopes to encourage other people. We really want it to be uh, um, a, 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 to help push Lewiston in the right direction for healing properly. You know we want to heal with unity and with strength. It's, it's going to be really tough and, until he's found especially with people knowing that he's still out there. And you know, we are a very hopeful community and I feel I think a lot of people are feeling pretty helpless right now. Yeah, helpless helpless but hopeful, but hoping to bring the community together as a sign of resilience. Kira, Terry. All right, Morgan Norwood, thank you for that. And now let's bring in uh, uh, with law enforcement working around the clock, our investigative reporter Aaron Katursky is with us now. So, Aaron, you know, the, the, Robert Card, he could be on the lam, he could be dead, he could be uh, plotting some other horrible uh, crimes. What, what are the theories and how are they going about searching for him? Well, the focal point has been the river, uh, as you pointed out, Terry, with uh, boats on the water, divers in the in the water, uh, trying to make that a focal point, because if he is, uh, in fact, dead and dead in the water, they, they want to be able to confirm that as soon as possible. There are still lockdown orders in effect in communities around Lewiston, and they want to be able to lift those as soon as possible, because they know simply, Terry, people aren't going to abide by them forever. Hmm. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Aaron Katursky, thanks very much for that. Well, of course, continue to follow the manhunt. Hopefully, authorities will be able to get Robert Card much sooner than later. Mm. Glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And there is more news on the other side. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. So I got a bunch of new pieces on Shein. 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 This company just seemed to come out of nowhere. Shein's tapping into our urge to consume, express ourselves. I spent $500 as Shein. Calling out a big company is scary. What makes Shein so different is that Unboxing Shein. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. ABC News, America's number one news source. ABC News, America's number one news source.
I'm Terry Moran. It's now 10 p.m. in Israel, and we begin with the breaking news from there. Israel is expanding ground operations inside Gaza. Those words come from a spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces, and we're also being told that the IDF has alerted hostage families about this incursion. But how many is still unclear. The IDF is also announcing that Israel will be, quote, acting with great force to achieve the objectives of the war, unquote. Starting us off, our foreign correspondent James Longman there in Tel Aviv. James, what do we know about what's happening right now tonight in Gaza at this hour? Well, it's a moving situation. About an hour ago, we had news that uh, all communications seem to have been cut with Gaza. That was from a communications company and the Palestinian Red Crescent said they couldn't get through to people in Gaza either. And then the IDF reported they uh, were expanding their ground operation, but it wasn't clear exactly uh, what that meant. Uh, but for more on this, uh, let's bring in Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell. I know details are thin at the moment, but Ian, what can you tell us uh, about what Israel is doing currently in the south of Israel? Israel. Yeah, okay, so first of all, let's look at what we actually know. We know that statement from the IDF that it's expanding operations in Gaza. Now, does this constitute an incursion or an invasion, which we know that the Israeli government was planning? Uh, we've heard that on the record from the Prime Minister. Uh, we won't know unless either the Israeli Defence Forces change their statement, say that's what it is, and on the record, they're certainly telling ABC News that it isn't the start of the invasion at the moment. Or when dawn comes tomorrow morning here in Israel, that those forces that have crossed over into Gaza are still there. Um, we saw what you would normally expect to be the precursors for a significant land operation. This, this intense bombardment, the severing of communications, at least internet outages, if not totally off. Uh, those would be all the things that you would expect to see on the ground. Um, they say that the hostage families have been contacted. I know that you've spoken to the family of one hostage who's, who cast doubt on that. The IDF, the Israeli government, certainly made it clear that they had contacted all of the family members. Earlier today I spoke with uh, the defense minister um, uh, here in Israel and we talked a lot about this. He talked about different phases of the war. He talked about phase one being, first of all, trying to make uh, Israel safe and secure. In other words, from the attacks that happened on October the 7th and, uh, and conducting these uh, sea, air and ground operations in Gaza. Uh, and then the next stage would then be the land operation. We were given a very clear impression that we we're getting close towards the, the transition from one of those phases into the other. But clearly there are huge complications. There are complications, of course, because of the more than 220 hostages who are there on the ground. There's a lot of domestic pressure here in Israel from the families and supporters that those hostages be released beforehand. We know the United States is also applying some pressure and it wants Israel to moderate its war plans. We know that Qatar and other countries are actively involved in those negotiations. Uh, and you know, the longer this has gone on, the more pressure there is on Israel to modify, uh, if not totally change its plans, to try and assuage increasing criticism from the Allies. And Ian, a, a serious situation inside Gaza, obviously, for the last three weeks, but with this suggestion now that communications have been cut off, I mean, it must be truly terrifying inside Gaza Strip. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we're getting odd reports from, from some of the people who, 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 you know, are still in there, some of the reporters, some of the families that we've been able to kind of stay in touch with. Uh, but for most people, those lines of communications have been cut. Um, some of the images that seem to be emerging from inside Gaza it shows an incredibly heavy bombardment, possibly the heaviest bombardment since the, the start of this latest phase of the conflict in, on, on October 7th. After the Hamas massacre here in Israel, um, so intense bombardment. Many civilians, of course, have been told to move down. Again, Defence Minister Gallant said they'd gone out of their way to tell civilians that there would be something uh, happening in the north of Gaza and that they should move to the south. <clears throat> but we also know many of those areas that they fled to uh, have also come under attack. So I think for many people on the ground, they simply feel that there is nowhere safe. A and certainly for the people of Gaza, after uh, you know so many days, every day, every night of this bombardment, this latest round, this prospect of a land incursion, uh, for many people will be terrifying. Ian Panel, thank you. Kieran Terry, back to you.
All right, James, thanks so much. And also joining us now as this news breaks is Avi Hai Brodich, whose wife and young children were actually abducted by Hamas back on October 7th. He has been desperately waiting to find out anything about their condition and or their whereabouts. He actually joins us here in D.C. Uh, in our bureau. Avi Hai, just in light of this breaking news, uh, let me ask you if, if you have heard anything today from the IDF about this expanding ground operation or, or anything about your family. No, I haven't. It's still the same news I have uh, since three weeks ago. Um, well, for me, nothing has changed. And uh, from this IDF, what's happening now, I just heard on the news. And <clears throat> Avihai, if, if I may ask you, the. Uh, our foreign correspondent we were just listening to, uh, Ian Panel, uh, mentioned a briefing that he had with the Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, uh, Gallant, who outlined the goals, number one, destroy Hamas, number two, return the hostages. Uh, I, this is your country and your family. And that is a, 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 a terrible place to be in a time of war. And I just wonder if you feel the hostages are at, including your loved ones, are being considered at the appropriate level are they the right does the government have the right priority for your family well if that's that's what he said then he's obviously got his priorities wrong and uh, that's why I'm here you know to get the priorities right again uh, the hostages you know the, there are women and children over there and children have definitely got nothing to do with it along with the women and uh, that's the first priority it's obvious throughout you know throughout humanity the children shouldn't be involved they should shouldn't be involved they should be out of there right now so we got to change these priorities right away Abi hi as we look at pictures of your kids uh, your wife tell us about them uh, please um, how old they are their names just humanize your your family for us since we haven't had the chance to meet them yet and hopefully we will well you know I've known my wife for 22 years since I was 20 years old uh, you know, Hagal, I love her very much. She's the love of my life. She does everything for me. I'm, you know, I, I look, you know, like, I, I look strong now, but I'm not, you know, deep inside, I'm lost. She's, 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 she's done everything for me throughout my life, and, you know, I just want her back so much. And, you know, <laughs> I sleep alone now. I really miss her. <laughs> so I really hope she'll be back soon. Um, she, you know, we have three beautiful children. Uh, my youngest, Uriah, he's four and a half years old. You know, he, he likes to make a big mess in the house. He likes to play soccer inside the house and break things. And now I wish, I wish he was just there breaking things. Uh, my middle child, you know, my middle son, Yuval, he's a very sensitive type. So I have to say I'm really worried about him. Uh, so, you know, he plays Xbox a lot. I see kids here playing Xbox and, you know, I, I feel for him. <laughs> I'm really, you know, it's terrible just to see it. And, you know, he likes playing soccer as well, and he builds all these Legos all the time. And, you know, I just walked past the Lego shop, and I wanted to buy him something, but, you know, I don't know where he is and how he's doing, so it was terrible. And my eldest, which is my little girl, <laughs> Ofri, uh, you know, she's just this beautiful girl, and I miss her so much. I got a guitar. She left her, well, obviously, you know, her guitar is back home. I just got it from her, from the house. I asked someone to bring it to me. And every day I play her guitar and, you know, I think of her and it's really terrible. She just celebrated her birthday. You know, on the day of, of the attack, we were meant to celebrate with her friends and there's still cake in the fridge. I know that because the soldiers came, you know, the IDF came into my house just to see that they told me that they, were, they weren't there, they were, that no bodies were found, but they also opened the fridge and they saw the cake. And I just met with one of them a few days ago and he told me they all started crying when they, when they saw the cake and the candle on it and they knew what was going on. So, you know, it's just terrible. I, I miss them so much and I really want them to come back. And, you know, you were asking me before the priorities. This is obviously the first priority. They've done nothing wrong. My girl just wants to celebrate her birthday like all her friends. You know, my sons just want to play soccer. So that's obviously the first priority. Somebody's got something wrong in their minds. And Abihai, I just want to say you, you have a beautiful 
family. Hmm. You're blessed, thank clearly, you and we thank you for, for sharing that with, you, with us. And I want to ask you just one more question. You're here in Washington, D.C., to see what American policymakers here can do. They're deeply involved, obviously, since they're American hostages, too. What have you heard? What are you looking for from the American government? And uh, how, how have your meetings gone? You know, I just got this so much support. I, I think, you know, America is just this great nation. That, you, you know, I got so much support in Israel, but that's obvious. And I came over here and I got so much support from the government and, you know, government officials, just everybody I met. People prayed for me this morning. You know, I was having my breakfast and this lady came and she says, she told me, I just want to pray for you. And she hugged us, you know, the whole team. And, she just prayed for us, you know, the same with, with everyone, you know, the senators I met and, you know, all the congressmen, they just gave me so much support and I really wish they could change, you know, the, the, the situation and bring my family back home to me. Avi, hi. I hope you stay in close touch with us um, because you remind us why we need to cover this story and why we need to talk to parents like you, your wife, your three kids. I know you're not giving up hope. Nobody um, is right now. And um, just stay, stay close with us as things uh, pick up here overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be doing everything we can to ca ca cover what's happening here, obviously, in the United States mm -hmm. as well. Thank you, Abhi. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. James, we'll take it back to you in Tel Aviv. Yeah, heartbreaking stories from the families who are waiting to, to hear about their loved ones who've been taken hostage, but also so many around the world worried for their loved ones. Gazans, Palestinians also stuck inside Gaza because it has been uh, sealed off and they can't get out. Most Gazans, of course, uh, are not Hamas militants. They are civilians uh, and they have been uh, trapped in the middle of this war for weeks now. Uh, several communications companies have released statements just this evening saying all communications and internet services have been cut off following intense Israeli bombing. And I want to bring in now Jihad Abu Salim. He's a Palestinian scholar and policy analyst uh, from Gaza. He also grew up there. Uh, we saw earlier photographs uh, of his childhood uh, inside Gaza. Jihad, thank you for joining us. We spoke only an hour or so ago, but since then we had this news that uh, the IDF have expanded this action in the south, whatever that means, and that uh, possibly communications have been cut off uh, to some parts of Gaza. Uh, can I ask who is there uh, and uh, when was the last time you were able to speak with them? Um, I have lost contact with my family uh, three hours ago. Uh, no one is picking up, no one is answering the phone, no one is responding to my text messages. Um, there are very few reports that are coming out of Gaza. We were, were, were fortunate to have Al Jazeera covering uh, what's happening on the ground, uh, the bombardment uh, of the city. But even uh, Al Jazeera's team cannot uh, cover every aspect of uh, what's unfolding right now. Uh, based on what we're hearing, we're hearing that uh, the Gaza Strip now is under uh, an unprecedented level of bombardment uh, compared to the past few days. I mean, think about this relative to what we have witnessed so far, the mass destruction, the mass killing. Uh, the, the destruction of entire neighborhoods, entire towns, like the town of Beit Hanun in northern Gaza, completely destroyed. So when, when I hear now that my family, who I can't be in touch with, uh, my siblings, my father, my mother, that they are under this heavy bombardment, um, I, I, can, I cannot stop thinking about the words of a friend who just posted uh, on, on social media. He wrote... I am really afraid that the, that communication with Gaza will be restored, but there won't be anyone to answer on the other end. Yeah, that is that is a very startling, startling thought. And, and, and you, of course, are trying to get through to your family, but your mother and father are there. Try just to, to paint a picture of what it's like being in the United States, unable to contact them. Just explain what that's like for you it's not easy it's not easy because you know here in the united states um you know you, you you're you're just hearing the news and waiting and and this this waiting is is very heavy it's 
um, it, it, it puts you in a very difficult situation, just, you know, waiting for a notification, uh, for a text message, calling um, continuously to, to make sure that your loved ones are alive. This is not easy. And, uh, you know, it, it's difficult to capture in words what that feels. Uh, it's been almost 20 days now. And uh, I can tell you, um, I've lost neighbors, I've lost friends, I've lost relatives, uh, entire homes that I used to um. pass by when, you know, growing up in, in, in the town of Deir el-Balah in the, in the middle of the Gaza Strip, no, neighborhoods okay. that I, you know, I have memories uh, attached to, they're all gone. So, you know, for, for every individual, for every Palestinian from Gaza who's abroad, who's, you know, who lives outside of the Gaza Strip, it is time passes in a, in a, in a heavy manner, just waiting for that piece of news that might be devastating or just being relieved every, an hour, every one hour, every two hours, once someone picks up uh, on the other end and says, hey, we're alive. Um, and, and even that luxury of being able to check in on our families and make sure that they're still breathing, that they're okay, is something that we're deprived of now. We can't even we can't even get through to to our loved ones and make sure that they're alive. Well, Jihad Abu Salim, thank you for speaking to us. And I think I speak for everyone when I say I really hope that you can speak to your family as soon as possible when connections are restored. Thank you, and Kira Terry, I'll throw it back to you in New York. James, thank you. So let's bring in our, our senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez, national security and defense analyst, Mick Mulroy. He's also the former deputy assistant and secretary of defense for the Middle East. Uh, and our contributor and retired U.S. Army General, General Robert Abrams. Gentlemen, thank you. And General Abrams, if I can, if I can begin with you, we don't know exactly what it is that we're seeing out of the Israeli Defense Forces. It, it does, obviously, they're showing us some pictures, and we are getting reports that they, uh, this is more of uh, a raid or, or any kind of probing. It seems like they are at least in Gaza, perhaps to stay. We'll find out later. But I just want you to talk for a minute, something we've heard about. But from your perspective, the challenge of this operation, we just heard from hostages and from uh, a, a, a Palestinian whose family is in Gaza. The challenges for the Israeli Defense Forces to accomplish their objective, which is to destroy Hamas's capacity to attack Israel, with, with the complications of that dense urban environment and so many hostages. And, and, and I'd add uh, untold, you know, million plus uh, non-combatants in addition to the hostages also oh. complicates it. Um, look, I, I don't want to overstate it, but it's it's almost mission impossible to keep all of those requirements in balance. Uh, um, the laws of armed conflict dictate how the IDF should conduct their operations, and, and they're doing it in an incredibly congested area. Uh, imagine 100,000 troops on the outskirts of Manhattan, uh, if you will. It's that level of density that we're talking about. and distinguishing between combatants and non-combatants, where you have Hamas, who is completely intertwined with civilian society, makes it almost mission impossible to accomplish those objectives and observe the laws of armed conflict. Not only mission impossible, but Mick, what about the end game? Let's say the IDF dismantles Hamas goes in there and, and, and roots them out. Uh, then what? Who, who's in charge? Who, who runs Gaza? Who's the political party that everybody believes in? How do you prevent a resurgence? I mean, I'm having flashbacks of Iraq where, oh, there was this big mission accomplished, which definitely was not mission accomplished. They might have taken out Saddam Hussein, but then look what happened to the country and the people and the leadership. I mean, is there a, an, a plan here for if, if, if they indeed go in and dismantle Hamas? Do they have a plan for what happens after that? Yeah, I think it's, it's um, you know, that's a hypothetical, but I, I don't think the goal is dismantle. That's not what I've read. The IDF want to completely destroy, which is a much higher task than dismantling. And again, mm. I, I think it's, 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 it's virtually impossible um, because as, as every five fighters die, it'll, it'll spawn another 10 fighters. I mean, this is what we, we, the U.S. military, learned 
over 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's not as simple as it sounds to, quote, eradicate or eliminate Hamas, especially in this sort of a, an environment. And and Mick Mick, I understand that that, that we can hear. And I want to take to you the this remarkable relationship, military to military, between uh, the Israeli Defense Forces, which have this assignment, this very difficult assignment. General Abrams been been talking about, uh, and the U.S. military establishment. Secretary Defense Secretary Austin has been over there. Obviously, there's close coordination at the head of state level. What what is America? What has the United States been trying? to urge uh, Israel to do, and, and how much influence can we have? Do you, how do you see that critical relationship for Israel and for the stability of that region working out at this point? So, Terry, to, to Kira's earlier question, I think one of the things the United States can do, and I was in Baghdad when, when Saddam fell, and we really didn't have a plan. So there's a lot of things that we can bring from our own experience. Not that we're superior, but we have already been through it. Not just with having a plan after the actual major combat operations in for a potential insurgency, which I think we will see here as well, and how are they going to deal with that, but also how to fight in urban terrain, you know, whether it's Mosul in 2016, or Fallujah, all these places that we've fought and, and learned so much, not only how to win, but also how to avoid civilian casualties. I think those are the things that the United States is trying to help the Israelis, the IDF specifically, deal with, both our expertise in, in conducting the operation, but also conducting it within the laws of armed conflict, like the general mentioned. Mm. And Louis, you reported not only about the, the expanding ground operation in, in Gaza tonight, but also the fact that the IDF reached out to, uh, they said, the spokesperson said 229 hostage families. We're not quite sure uh, how many family members have been contacted. We've asked a couple that we know. They have not been contacted yet. Do you have any idea uh, what the families would have been told? Hmm. Kira, what we're told is that the, the families were notified essentially about the status of negotiations, uh, not necessarily about the ground operations themselves. Uh, what we are seeing now is the IDF essentially saying that they are expanding their ground operations, but we don't know the scope. We're don't not exactly sure exactly what that means. But we do have new reporting from Martha Raddatz, who has spoken to a senior U.S. official who has information that says that what we will be seeing from Israel is more of a limit incursion. Now, that is very different from that mass, massive invasion that we have been contemplating or expecting on the part of the Israeli Defense Forces, but maybe that's a part of exactly how they're going to describe it, as a limited incursion. Well, the other information that we have from the senior U.S. official is that they will also be pairing uh, this operation with the flow of humanitarian assistance. We know that we've been watching what's been going on there at the border inside with Egypt, um, and that the flow has been very limited. So it's clear exactly how that flow will continue as Israel mounts up a larger incursion. Louis, Mick, General, thank you all so much, as usual. Appreciate it. Well, coming up, the urgent manhunt in Maine continues to grow, and we're learning more about the victims as well. Stay with us. Halloween morning, someone somewhere in America is going to get one incredible surprise when GMA knocks on their door live and gives them VIP tickets to a Monday night football game of their dreams. See the surprise happen live Tuesday on Good Morning America. GMA next week. Wake up with Jennifer Garner cooking things up. The best deals and steals on Oprah's favorite things, new kids on the block, Cheryl Crow, and some mad, scary fun Halloween surprises. Halloween morning on GMA. Glad you're streaming with us now uh, to that urgent manhunt taking place for the mass shooting suspect uh, in Lewiston, Maine. Hundreds of law enforcement agents at this hour looking for 40-year-old Robert Card. Shelter in place order remaining in effect for several cities now surrounding that area. Police say nearby waterways, as you saw there, are now a major focus for them today. This after investigators say the suspect's car was found abandoned at a nearby boat dock, Robert Card is accused of killing 18 people, injuring 13 others in a shooting rampage on Wednesday night. Police say they have received more than 500 tips and leads in this case. Neighbors in the surrounding areas 
are understandably on edge with the shelter in place order still in place. That's right. We've got reporters covering all angles of the story, but we do take it to our Morgan Norwood, who uh, has been reporting since the very beginning on this. What are you learning at this hour, Morgan? Well, Carrie, I can tell you we're starting to see our first signs of strength and resilience, especially as this community continues to reel after that horrific shooting here. You know, we talked about this earlier. This lockdown in some ways has really put the pause on the grieving process. No memorials, no vigils, um, no signs. But all of that just changed within the past few minutes when Alex McMahon, he's a local business owner who just placed a sign just outside the scene here. It's out of the frame, but we'll show it to you. Um, it says Lewiston Strong, um, and he wants it to be known as, a, you know, just a sign of strength strength and resilience and he wants the same for the city of Lewiston as well. Here's what he had to say about how he's doing and how he hopes to encourage other people. We really want it to be uh, um, a, 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 to help push Lewiston in the right direction for healing properly. You know we want to heal with unity and with strength. It's, it's going to be really tough and, until he's found especially with people knowing that he's still out there. And you know, we are a very hopeful community and I feel I think a lot of people are feeling pretty helpless right now. Yeah, helpless helpless but hopeful but hoping to bring the community together as a sign of resilience. Kira, Terry. All right, Morgan Norwood, thank you for that. And now let's bring in uh, uh, with law enforcement working around the clock, our investigative reporter Aaron Katursky is with us now. So, Aaron, you know, the, or Robert Card, he could be on the lam, he could be dead, he could be uh, plotting some other horrible uh, crimes. What are, what are the theories, and how are they going about? searching for him. Well, the focal point has been the river, uh, as you pointed out, Terry, with uh, boats on the water, divers in the in the water, uh, trying to make that a focal point, because if he is, uh, in fact, dead and dead in the water, they, they want to be able to confirm that as soon as possible. There are still lockdown orders in effect in communities around Lewiston, and they want to be able to lift those as soon as possible, because they know simply, Terry, people aren't going to abide by them forever. Hmm. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Aaron Katursky, thanks very much for that. Well, of course, continue to follow the manhunt. Hopefully, authorities will be able to get Robert Card much sooner than later. Mm. Glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. And there is more news on the other side. Watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Tonight, the victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. At any point, you can encounter evil. Young woman riding her bike and she gets abducted. Where is she? It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. You get the phone call. She's been found. One of the worst pains you can ever have. I kind of had to stop my jaw from falling. What kind of person would do this to this? Evil person. The 2020 true crime event. David Muir, Deborah Roberts. Tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. Reporting outside the Gaza Strip, I'm Matt Gutman. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live this hour, beginning with breaking news, Israel expanding ground operations in Gaza. The IDF now releasing a statement saying in recent hours we've increased the attacks in Gaza. The Air Force widely attacking underground targets and terrorist infrastructure very significantly. Internet and phone services have collapsed in the Gaza Strip, largely cutting off its 2.3 million people from the outside world and each other. The closing bell 
bell sounding on Wall Street. Stocks closing mixed with the Dow and S&P 500 seeing heavy losses today. The Dow is shaving off nearly 400 points, losing more than 1%. The Nasdaq, however, finishing the week on a good note, closing 20% higher on the heels of a stellar earnings report from e-commerce giant Amazon. Big losses today, Chevron, J.P. Morgan, and Verizon all falling more than 3%. Well, it's been waiting for you. 1989, Taylor's version has officially been released. The new version of the 2014 hit album features all 21 original hits plus five new tracks from The Vault. This re-release follows a report from Bloomberg declaring Swift's billionaire status now. Her Eras Tour, which picks up again in November, is projected to be the first concert ever to gross $1 billion in ticket sales. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you 24-7. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. GMA 3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA 3. The new developments overseas. The U.S. launching airstrikes over Syria. The Pentagon retaliating against recent Iran-backed attacks on American forces. Global Affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz here with the latest. And we are learning more about the man in Maine accused of the worst mass shooting of the year and the devastation he has left behind. I know how important early detection is. Plus, we're used to following her lead on the bike. What Peloton star Leanne Hainsby is now urging after her battle with breast cancer. Hi. Hello. And if you love a little one, you probably know this voice and face very well. Eva's conversation with the YouTube sensation, Miss Rachel. And doing a better job as a neighbor, even when it comes to strangers. Some Faith Friday wisdom here, inviting us all to broaden what it means to be Christian. And our GMA3 spotlight on Broadway, the 20th anniversary of the beloved musical Wicked. The very special chat and performance just for us, for good. with a B, fueled by the Airs Tour, the remarkable new personal milestone for Taylor Swift and the new music moment just released. Now from Times Square, DeMarco Morgan and Eva Pilgrim with Dr. Jen Ashton and what you need to know. We made it to Friday. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to What You Need to Know. And look who's back. Oh, yes. Back from L.A. I miss you guys. That's so a happy dance right there. That's a little more than we normally see. We're shaking see. off into the weekend. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. I'm very happy that it's Friday. Yes, we are. All right, Dr. Jen, let's talk medical news if we can. Uh, the CDC has issued a food safety alert after a multi-state outbreak of salmonella, and it's linked to fresh diced onions. Yeah, unfortunately. So here's what you need to know. And if you're tracking foodborne illness, this is something that we hear hear about consistently in the medical headlines. Um, here's the latest from the CDC. There are approximately 73 people across 22 states, at least at this point, uh, sickened with salmonella. These are linked to Gill's Onions, fresh diced onion products with a use by date of August 2023. So most of them should be out of your refrigerator by this point. Uh, if you have them, you want to discard them, wash any items or surfaces that have come in close contact with them. Uh, symptoms of salmonella poisoning, or illness, largely gastrointestinal, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever. Um, and big picture, according to the CDC, they estimate 1.35 million infections due to salmonella in this country every year, mm -hmm. just over 26,000 hospitalizations and at least 400 deaths. That's the big picture. But when you think about our food supply, you guys, and how many millions of Americans are exposed to potential foodborne illness, it's really impressive that we have the ability to track to this level level of degree. But August 2023, that should have already been out of the yeah, fridge. Yeah, unless it's been put in something like a tomato sauce that's sitting in your refrigerator or frozen. Either way, you want to get rid of it. Good All right. Thank you. You bet. We turn now to ABC's Will Carr in Los Angeles. He has our latest headlines. Good afternoon to you, Will. 
Happy Friday, guys. We begin with the new developments overseas. The U.S. launching airstrikes in skies over Syria, targeting two munitions facilities. The Pentagon says they're linked to at least 19 recent rocket and drone attacks on U.S. forces in the region. Our Martha Raddatz with the latest on that coming up here. As tensions grow in the region, Israeli tanks entering the Gaza Strip for a second day, said to be its largest ground incursion so far as a furious debate grows inside Israel on whether to move forward with an official ground invasion to try to root out Hamas or to wait as the Biden administration has been urging. The humanitarian crisis inside Gaza deepening. And back here at home, we're learning more about the gunmen suspected of the massacre in Maine, the worst mass shooting so far this year. ABC News has learned the suspect's sister has told authorities that the Army reservist suspected of gunning down residents may have been going after an ex-girlfriend. Republican Congressman George Santos is back in court again today to face new charges, including lying to some donors as fellow Republican lawmakers move forward with plans to have him removed from Congress. A vote expected to be taken next week. Santos has denied criminal wrongdoing. Now Ginger Z has a look at our week in weather. Two tornadoes with that cold front. Look at them go through San Antonio over Interstate 35. Thankfully, no injuries reported, but there was some damage. And that big temperature gradient, meaning the difference in temperature, um, one side of the front to the other, is fueling it. We had record highs in parts of the mid-Atlantic all the way up into the Northeast, and we could do more of those. Easily 10 to 20 degrees above average, but you know this doesn't last forever. We are going to see a significant cool down by about 50 degrees anywhere from Chicago over to the Northeast by next week. dreams coming true thanks to those unstoppable fans bloomberg reporting taylor swift has been catapulted into billionaire with a b status after that rock solid eras tour and more reason for swifties to celebrate the pop star now out with the taylor version of her 1989 album that tour projected to be the first concert to generate more than one billion dollars in ticket sales and now the highest grossing concert film of all time and guys I don't know what you think but I think that it might be time that Travis Kelsey start thinking about going ring shopping sometimes <laughs> hey if, he, if he's smart he would relationship <laughs> yeah. carry that man along let them enjoy the dating well I'm with you secure the bag right, billionaire you. there you go right. still ahead on this Friday on GMA3 what are Martha Raddatz is now reporting about those U.S. airstrikes in Syria we'll speak with her in just a moment on the new developments plus how Peloton's Leanne Haynes is using her own personal health crisis to help others. GMA3, when we come back. Whenever news breaks. The crushing families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the storm. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Halloween morning, someone somewhere in America is going to get one incredible surprise when GMA knocks on their door live and gives them VIP tickets to a Monday night football game of their dreams. See the surprise happen live Tuesday on Good Morning America. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. GMA next week. Wake up with Jennifer Garner cooking things up. The best deals and steals on Oprah's favorite things. New Kids on the Block, Cheryl Crow, and some mad, scary, fun Halloween surprises. Halloween morning on GMA. Welcome back to GMA3. We are tracking the latest on the U.S. airstrikes in Syria. We mentioned at the top of the show targeting facilities that American officials are linking to Iranian-backed militant groups. Now, the Pentagon says the strikes are a response to recent rocket and drone attacks on U.S. forces. And the move comes at a time of heightened tensions in the Middle East amid the ongoing Israel-Hamas war. And ABC Chief Global Affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz has the latest. Overnight retaliation. In the skies above Syria's border with Iraq, a pair of American F-16 fighter jets targeting two munitions facilities the Pentagon says were linked to a spate of recent rocket and drone attacks on U.S. forces in the region. Both facilities, says the Pentagon, aligned with Iranian-backed militias. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin saying the United States does not seek conflict and has no intention nor desire to engage in further hostilities, but these Iranian-backed attacks against U.S. forces are unacceptable and must stop. There have been at least 19 attacks on American forces in Iraq and Syria, leaving nearly two dozen U.S. service members with minor injuries, including symptoms of traumatic brain injury. The attacks on Americans escalate as the war in Israel heats up. Earlier this week, President Biden warning Iran's supreme leader. My warning to the Ayatollah was that if they continue to move against those troops, we will respond, and he should be prepared. But while the U.S. stopped short of targeting Iran itself, a senior U.S. official saying Iran's fingerprints were all over these attacks. One week ago, the Pentagon shooting down numerous missiles and drones it said were launched from Iranian-backed militants in Yemen aimed in the direction of Israel and a U.S. destroyer in the Red Sea. And joining us now is Chief Global Affairs Correspondent Martha Raddatz. Martha, I have to ask you, what was the strategy here? Well, I think there was a lot of debate about this, whether they should really hit those uh, militants hard or do a limited response. And it, with two F-16s and hitting two munitions facilities, they went for the limited response. I think number one in their mind right now is they do not want this war to spread. They do not want to provoke the militants any further than they've already provoked because they've been trying to deter them for weeks. They have an aircraft carrier out there. They have another one on the way. Uh, they're adding additional troops in the region and still these attacks have happened again and again. I, I, I think people forget that we have troops in Syria and Iraq. We have hundreds in Syria. We have thousands in Iraq and they're there uh, fighting ISIS and, and trying to make sure that ISIS doesn't come back in force. And meanwhile, over these past few weeks. They've just been pummeled. Uh, no one has been hurt seriously, but there is always that chance when you're attacked by drones and missiles. So Martha, does the Biden administration expect more attacks from Iran? And if so, what's being done to protect our troops? 
Well, I, I, I think they are. I think they're bracing for that, DeMarco, because it really could happen any time. I think they're hopeful uh, that these that our attacks on, on these munitions facilities will send a strong message. But it was just a week ago we sent a pretty strong message as well uh, by shooting down those missiles coming out of Yemen. And, and I think there are about 15 drones they shot down. So they are hopeful that they will stop. Uh, but there is absolutely no guarantee that will happen. And then the U.S. is going to have to reassess and say, now what do we do? Do we keep these sort of pinprick strikes on munitions facilities, or, or do you go wider and harder? And, and that's really the debate within the White House. Such a delicate balance in that region. Chief Global Affairs Correspondent Martha Raddatz, thank you so much Martha, for joining thank us. You. you bet. Well, coming up next here, the Peloton star with an urgent request. Yeah, how she's using her battle with breast cancer to inspire others. What Leanne Hainsby wants you to know about your health when we come back, stay with us. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Tonight, the victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. So I got a bunch of new pieces on Shein. 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 This company just seemed to come out of nowhere. Shein's tapping into our urge to consume and express ourselves. I spent $500 as Shein. Calling out a big company is scary. What makes Shein so different is that. Unboxing Shein. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Shein. 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 This company just seemed to come out of nowhere. Shein's tapping into our urge to consume and express ourselves. I spent $500 as Shein. Calling out a big company is scary. What makes Shein so different is that. Unboxing Shein. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Traveling with the president in Vietnam, I'm Selena Wang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, folks, we're back now with Peloton star Leanne Hainsby. No stranger to challenging her body to be healthy, but a recent surprising diagnosis with breast cancer is taking that battle to a whole new level. ABC's Maggie Ruley sat down with Leanne in her home in London to learn about her inspirational road to recovery and her message to other women everywhere. She's known for her sweat-dripping spin classes. Yes to you, come on! Fun fitness fashion. And bubbly personality. Take it! But at just 34 years old, Leanne Hainsby became known for something she wasn't expecting, a breast cancer survivor. I get it out. <laughs> we meet up with Leanne in London. She takes us to the home she shares with her fiance, Ben Aldis. The two, both Peloton instructors. 
Leanne says she's always been in tune with her own body, dancing since she was just three years old, and touring as a dancer with some of the world's biggest stars. She tells us she instantly knew something was wrong when she first felt a lump. My right hand had just grazed my left breast. I think I was throwing the cover off of me. I was so, so hot. And I just screamed. I was like, I've got breast cancer. At first, her doctor dismissed it as a benign hormonal cyst. But she says she knew something was wrong. My gut said then, my gut said then, don't leave this. Leanne was diagnosed with early triple positive breast cancer in August of 2022. You're young. Yeah. You are very healthy, very fit. I mean, you're a fitness instructor. Yeah. <laughs> Most people would think this would never happen mm. to someone like Leanne. Yeah, it can happen to anybody. Cancer doesn't care whether you're healthy, rich, poor. What was the treatment like for you? It was really, really tough. I did 12 weeks of chemo and I continued to teach my classes and I wanted to feel like me. I wanted to um, carry on as normal as possible. I didn't want the cancer to be controlling everything. Like this. <laughs> yeah. Always by her side, Ben. We truly believe that the experience that we've both been through in this journey has changed our perspective and changed our mindset for the better. Leanne and Ben putting their future first, rushing to do a round of IVF before starting chemo. And so this gave us comfort and just hopefully a gift when all of this is over. Leanne, now cancer free, is using her platform on the bike to raise awareness about early detection. I've created my own boob check collection. Early detection is so important and I really believe that that saved my life. Her line, made in partnership with Peloton, has already sold out with all proceeds going to the charity Copperfield. Now that you are where you are in this journey, what's next? I know how important early detection is and I want to wave that flag and just like hold that banner and be like, check and then check again, because the checking again for me is what saved my life. I love what she's doing. A lot of times things don't happen to you, they happen for you to be a blessing. Yeah, and now she's taking that and making sure other people are taking care of themselves mm -hmm. well, really inspirational. Bravo. Well, just ahead here on GMA3, Dr. Jen with a meditative prescription for wellness that can help with anxiety. She's back in town, and she's like Taylor Swift for toddlers. Eva's conversation with the YouTube sensation, Miss Rachel. Stay with us. got a bunch of new pieces on Shein. 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 This company just seemed to come out of nowhere. Shein's tapping into our urge to consume and express ourselves. I spent $500 as Shein. Calling out a big company is scary. What makes Shein so different is Unboxing Shein. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Halloween morning, someone somewhere in America is going to get one incredible surprise when GMA knocks on their door live and gives them VIP tickets to a Monday night football game of their dreams. See the surprise happen live Tuesday on Good Morning America. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Give it to me.
next week. Wake up with Jennifer Garner cooking things up. The best deals and steals on Oprah's favorite things. New kids on the block, Cheryl Crow, and some mad, scary fun Halloween surprises. Halloween morning on GMA. All right, folks, we're back now with America's favorite doctor. It's good to see you, Dr. Jana. There's a new study out there right now this afternoon uh, that's talking about how a common diabetes treatment may reduce your risk of dementia. Okay, so let me tell you what you need to know on this. this we're talking about a medication called metformin. This is to treat type 2 diabetes. It's an old, cheap, and safe drug that's been out for over 40 years oral, very common. Because so many people have been on it for so long, now we're finding all of these other observational or associated potential benefits mm -hmm. uh, to it. And this latest study uh, published in the journal JAMA Neurology looked at people with type 2 diabetes who were on metformin and then stopped taking the drug and followed their risk for progression to dementia. They found that the people who stopped taking metformin had a 1.2 fold increased risk of progression of dementia. It's very complicated in terms, I can see the, the methodology <laughs> wheels spinning as Eve is <laughs> listening to this uh, um, as a science lover. It's not clear whether the type two diabetes progressed and got worse because they discontinued the drug and that contributed to dementia. But the more we can study drugs that are commonly taken for anything, but mm -hmm. particularly diabetes and dementia, the more information we can glean as to whether or not there's risks, benefits, pros, cons, and this was an interesting study. People are so scared of medication to begin with. Is, is there anything that you could do to reduce your risk that doesn't involve medicine? Yeah, so before you're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or dementia, lifestyle so important. Exercise, not smoking, eating a diet, Ooh, low yeah. in saturated fat, doing things that challenge us cognitively, puzzles, learning music, that kind of engagement uh, is really, really important. And again, as we live longer, we all have to worry about this, and we need to start in our midlife. Let's start now. All right, we're back in a moment. Stay with us. At any point, you can encounter evil. A young woman riding her bike, and she gets abducted. Where is she? It made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. You get the phone call. She's been found. One of the worst pains you can ever have. I kind of had to stop my jaw from falling. What kind of person would do this suicide? Evil person. The 2020 true crime event. David Muir, Deborah Roberts. Tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. So I got a bunch of new pieces on Shein. 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 This company just seemed to come out of nowhere. Shein's tapping into our urge to consume and express ourselves. I spent $500 as Shein. Calling out a big company is scary. What makes Shein so different is Unboxing Shein. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Tonight, the victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. GMA next week. Wake up with Jennifer Garner cooking things up. The best deals and steals on Oprah's favorite things. New kids on the block, Cheryl Crow, and some mad, scary fun Halloween surprises. Halloween morning on GMA. Halloween morning, someone somewhere in America is going to get one incredible surprise when GMA knocks on their door live and gives them VIP tickets to a Monday night football game of their dreams. See the surprise happen live Tuesday on Good Morning America. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live.
Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're watching for you here at ABC News Live this hour. Breaking news in Israel as it expands ground operations in Gaza. The IDF now releasing this statement saying, in recent hours, we've increased the attacks in Gaza. The Air Force widely attacking underground targets and terrorist infrastructure very significantly. Internet and phone services have also collapsed in the Gaza Strip, largely cutting off its 2.3 million people from the outside world and each other. The urgent manhunt in Lewiston, Maine, for accused killer Robert Card still in full force. Hundreds of law enforcement agents at this hour urgently searching for the 40-year-old mass shooting suspect. Nearby waterways, a major focus for police right now after investigators say Card's car was found abandoned at a nearby boat dock. Robert Card is accused of killing 18 people and injuring 13 others. Police saying they've received more than 500 tips and leads in the case. Neighbors in the surrounding areas understandably on edge, including business owner Alex McMahon, who placed the first Lewiston Strong sign at the scene near the bowling alley. We really want it to be a... Uh, um they, 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 to help push Lewis in the right direction for healing properly. You know, we want to heal with unity and with strength. It's, it's going to be really tough and, until he's found, especially with people knowing that he's still out there. And, you know, we are a very hopeful community, and I, feel, I think a lot of people are feeling pretty helpless right now. Police say the shelter-in-place advisories are still in effect for Lewiston and surrounding areas throughout the weekend as the search for Robert Card continues. And a new development in the Donald Trump civil fraud trial. The former president now set to take the stand November 6th after a judge ruled that Ivanka Trump must also testify in her father's trial. The former president's daughter was dismissed as a defendant weeks ago, but state lawyers argued the former Trump Organization executive vice president has relative or relevant information. The president's other sons, Donald Jr. and Eric, are expected to testify as well. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming devices, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. More GMA3 right now. Jen is back now with her prescription for wellness. Are you guys mindfulness meditation? Mm -hmm. Are you still doing it I'm in the morning? I'm still doing it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we can see the difference. Can you tell? But we can tell, and you can feel a difference, right? <laughs> I can feel a difference, Okay, so, honestly. but for a lot of people who haven't practiced any meditation or mindfulness techniques, it can be intimidating. There's no wrong way to do it, but mm -hmm. some tips for people who want to get some of that physical and mental benefit um, in terms of breathing exercises, which is part of mindfulness and meditation. You want to sit quietly, take some deep breaths. I call them box breaths. In for four counts, hold it for four counts, out for four counts, and then breathe out uh, with your eyes closed even better. Um, focus that movement um, for about even a minute, 60 seconds, you know, will we'll give you a lot of those benefits. And I will tell you, you guys, if you try this, just try it for five days, you're not going to feel worse. Right, so any possible benefit that you get from mindfulness, breathing exercises, that calming, we all need it now more than ever. Uh, and there are some really, there's such good science on the benefits. And yeah. it's free. It's yeah. free. It's free. Yeah, it is free. It That's relaxes right. you, you and your mind. You use an app, right? I do. I do. Yeah. I'm trying Apps to be like good. you when I grow up. Oh. I am. I tell her that all the time. Please. Stop. 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 <laughs> and folks, we'd love to hear from you. So hit us up on Instagram with all of your medical questions for Dr. Jed at ABC GMA3. She really does give you advice when it comes to <laughs> meditating. Up next, the rise of Miss Rachel, the YouTube star so popular that she's called a godsend by parents. And my co-anchor, Eva, will have more on that. I Look love at you. her so much. And the Christian voice calling for a new conversation when it comes to the gospel. It's Faith Friday here. GMA3 when we come back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 
30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh, my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Halloween morning, someone somewhere in America is going to get one incredible surprise when GMA knocks on their door live and gives them VIP tickets to a Monday night football game of their dreams. See the surprise happen live Tuesday on Good Morning America. GMA next week. Wake up with Jennifer Garner cooking things up. The best deals and steals on Oprah's favorite things. New kids on the block, Cheryl Crow, and some mad, scary fun Halloween surprises. Halloween morning on GMA. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Tonight, the victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. All right, welcome back to GMA3. She has captivated millions, and I mean millions of kids, with her signature high-pitched voice and catchy melodies. But there's more to her bio videos than you just might think. Many parents are calling Miss Rachel a godsend. Her <laughs> YouTube channel dedicated to baby and toddler learning has exploded. I sat down with her recently to learn more about the woman behind the phenomenon. If you know a toddler, there's a good chance you know this voice. Hi. Hello. Rachel Griffin Accurso, known as Miss Rachel. The YouTube and TikTok sensation with nearly 7 million subscribers has been called this generation's Mr. Rogers. A beautiful day for a neighbor. I got a master's in music education and I was a public school music teacher. I was amazed how wonderful music is for bonding and soothing babies and toddlers. But everything changed when her own son experienced speech delays. You say the words. Yeah. Oftentimes you zoom in yeah. really close on the mouth. N says, mmm. I think for my son, his brain wasn't really connecting with his mouth, so we really needed to see what the mouth was doing. I wanted something for him so bad that would help him. And when it wasn't there, thought maybe we could create it for him and other kids that need it. I just didn't know it was going to be a lot of people. She says her methods are backed with research on speech development and early childhood education. On the show I might go, can you do this? Nose. Boop. We touched our nose. We touched our nose. So with that, I'm encouraging one imitation, and imitation is a building block of speech. I'm encouraging pointing, which is a milestone, and being silly, which is engaging. I'm thinking about a lot of things when I do something simple like that. <laughs> she says even that signature high pitch plays an important so role. It's funny, I have this sing-songy tone naturally, but around the world, studies show that 
All parents actually do raise their voice when they talk to babies and toddlers, and that that is helpful for their language development. It's like mind blowing because it seems so simple. Well, yeah, it's a lot of research and like dorky research I do. I read research papers. What's exciting is we see so many parents on social media working on these things away from the screen. <laughs> and using the techniques and the songs and the games. And, and that's just so wonderful to see because we don't want kids watching tons of TV. There's this whole kind of how much screen time should kids yeah. have? We shouldn't have them in front of the screen so much. Uh, how do you feel about all of that? What we try to do is provide the most helpful content we can that models all these wonderful techniques, songs, games that they can use away from the screen, and we really see that happening. I think a key word would be balance when it comes to screen time. Most parents are struggling. <laughs> Let's be honest yeah, about it. Yeah, they are, and I think we need less judgment and shame. I think we need to support parents, and you never know what someone's story is as well. You were yourself bullied as a child. Yeah, and the crazy thing I was realizing is I was bullied for my voice. I'm gonna cry saying this. It was so like high and like just being, oh my gosh, I didn't think I was gonna cry. Being so like, hi, people would bully me about that. And now it's like my superpower in a way. So like, that's just so cool. Why do you think you, your heart was set on being a teacher? What, what is it about being a teacher that you felt called to? <sighs> I remember I taught at a preschool for kids with disabilities and I went in thinking that I was going to change their lives. I was gonna help them. And then they transformed me. They gave me so much. And I was like, I wanna do this forever. I wanna help kids. I love kids so much and I love teaching and I'm so passionate about it. It's a joy that like sustains you. Not a fleeting joy, it's a joy that you can carry with you to serve kids. Oh my, she really is an angel and kids are addicted to her. One of my friends said that Miss Rachel has this daughter in a headlock <laughs> because she's so addicted. What was it about her that surprised you most? Well, there's definitely a warmth to her you can feel the second that you meet her, but you know, every little thing she does in those videos that seems so silly, it all has an educational purpose. Oh. And that deep love that she has for children comes across when you watch her it's on true, the screen. It's genuine. Um, we also have to say thank you to Sutton Tower for lending us that beautiful space and to the team at JVP Management, Gamma Real Estate, and Corcoran Sunshine Marketing Group. Thank you so much for letting us do that interview in that location. Great interview. Loved it. All right, coming up, a Faith Friday discussion that you don't want to miss. Author and pastor David Platt is joining us with a new way of looking at Christianity. GMA 3, when we come back. Families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. GMA next week. Wake up with Jennifer Garner cooking things up. The best deals and steals on Oprah's favorite things. New kids on the block, Cheryl Crow, and some mad, scary fun Halloween surprises. Halloween morning on GMA. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
good to watch, read. Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. I'm Lindsay Davis reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. There's been so much division and disillusionment and damage in the church over secondary and tertiary issues, particularly worldly politics. And we are not the bride of a political party or a politician. We're the bride of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Welcome back. It's Faith Friday. And that was a clip of our next guest, who is an author and pastor in the nation's capital, working to unite people and the church in a time of great division. He's got a huge following, and he wants his readers to start questioning what he calls the American gospel in his new book, Don't Hold Back. Please welcome David Platt to the studio. Good to see you, my man. It's great to be here. So what is the American gospel? Well, uh, putting it up as a counterfeit to the real thing, the real thing... That word gospel means good news. It's the greatest news in all the world, that God has created all of us for a relationship with him. We've all turned from God and his ways to ourselves. Uh, and as a result, we're broken people in a broken world. But God loves us so much. He's come to us in the person of Jesus. He's made a way through dying on a cross for us, rising from the dead, for us to be restored to relationship with him and now live as a reflection of his love. That gospel, this biblical gospel, I'm convinced we've exchanged. So this biblical gospel that exalts Jesus above everything in the world, we've exchanged it for an American gospel that I would say prostitutes Jesus for the sake of comfort and power and politics and prosperity in the world. You talk about that damage. There's so much division in this country, and there's division in the church. How do you bring people back together? That's what I love about seeing the power of the biblical gospel. In our church, we have people from over 100 different countries represented in it. So just, just picture them around the table. Like, you got two teenagers over here from totally different backgrounds, laughing, joking together. They're sitting next to someone who just moved from the Middle East, who uh, just became a U.S. citizen, sitting next to a war veteran who fought in the Middle East and is now in law enforcement, sitting next to an immigrant from... Central America, who just got here with little to no documentation, who's sitting next to a Republican lobbyist, who's passing the potatoes to a social activist living in shared housing. Like, what do these people have in common? It's not their political opinions or their personal preferences. It's their lives have been changed by the love, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And they have otherworldly love for each other. Like, we have, these groups will sit around at our tables and living rooms and, and talk with passionate disagreement about some of these different political opinions, but they don't walk away canceling each other. They walk away with arms around each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, and not just talking about justice, like doing it. I could tell you all kinds of stories from the book about how they're caring for orphans and widows and refugees in our country and other and countries. You know, we're almost out of time, but yeah. speaking of love for each other, words of wisdom, I mean, yeah. we're watching a conflict overseas. We just dealt with another mass shooting, more than a dozen people dead. What do you have for us this weekend? Uh, I would just encourage us not to give in to this cultural climate that fuels demonization of people and polarization. Like, let's, let's love our neighbors as ourselves. And I hope along the way, People will experience the love of Jesus that's otherworldly. But regardless of what we believe about the biblical gospel, that we might, we might love people regardless of where they're from, what they believe. And as a result, we would experience the kind of lives were created by our God to All live. Right, David, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And, of course, you can pick up a copy of Don't Hold Back everywhere that books our souls will go out and support this guy. Appreciate it. We're shining our GMA3 spotlight on Broadway when we come back. The very special performance of a beautiful song from the beloved musical celebrating its 20th anniversary. Get ready, Wicked fans, when we come back. Sure, I meant well, well, look at what well meant. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. 
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. So I got a bunch of new pieces on Shein. 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 This company just seemed to come out of nowhere. Shein's tapping into our urge to consume and express ourselves. I spent $500 as Shein. Calling out a big company is scary. What makes Shein so different is Unboxing Shein. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Halloween morning, someone somewhere in America is going to get one incredible surprise when GMA knocks on their door live and gives them VIP tickets to a Monday night football game of their dreams. See the surprise happen live Tuesday on Good Morning America. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Next week, wake up with Jennifer Garner cooking things up. The best deals and steals on Oprah's favorite things, new kids on the block, Cheryl Crow, and some mad, scary, fun Halloween surprises. Halloween morning on GMA. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. We are back now with a spotlight on Broadway. The production of Wicked is celebrating its 20th anniversary, making it the fourth longest running show in Broadway history. It is a fan favorite. More than 13 million people from around the world have made their way to the Gershwin Theater just to see the show. We are so lucky to have a very special performance right here. Here now is Wicked's own Alyssa Fox and Mackenzie Kurtz, a.k.a. Alphaba, and Glenda with For Good.
Mackenzie Kurtz, thank you very much for that. And Wicked, by the way, is playing at the Gershwin Theater on Broadway. And that is what you need to know for this week. So have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you back here on Monday. I'm DeMarco Morgan. And I'm Dr. John Ashton. And I'm Eva Pilgrim. For all of us here at ABC News, make it a great weekend. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being know you're gonna love this experience what all the buzz is about experience the all-new abc news app download it now 
Reporting from the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Olivia Rubin. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good afternoon to you. I'm Faith Abube in Washington. Thank you so much for watching ABC News Live. We begin right now with a growing manhunt in Maine. Accused killer Robert Carr still on the run this afternoon. Law enforcement agents expanding their search on land, in the air, and now we're learning they're also having divers go in the water. Officials are preparing to hold a press conference any moment now. Of course, we're monitoring that and we'll bring that live to you as soon as it happens. Uh, now, this is what we know so far at this moment. Robert Carr is a accused of killing 18 people and injuring 13 others. Police say they've received hundreds of tips and leads in this investigation. As they map out the mass murder suspect's potential escape routes, the Coast Guard now joining that search after learning Card has an access to a boat. Officials turning their focus now to a local boat launch. Meanwhile, the community is still on edge this evening. Schools in Lewiston closed for a second day with residents there sheltering in place. And now we're getting new details about the horror and the bravery during the shooting from some of the survivors. It's not something I ever want anybody to go through. <sighs> Everybody here is okay. But now it's the process of dealing with what she and I saw. Forward, who's on the ground in Lewiston, Maine, for us this afternoon. Morgan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, as of this morning, police were saying that they have so far only been able to notify eight of the victims' families. Uh, these are families who lost loved ones, meaning there are 10 more families out there waiting for that official news. Uh, what can you tell us about the grieving process and how it's playing out in this community? Well, Faith, I believe that you and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, you know, in some ways, this lockdown really has put the pause on the grieving process. You know, we hadn't uh, seen any memorials, any vigils, any signs, but all of that actually changed today a short time ago when a local businessman dropped by and placed a sign right outside of the scene here. It's, it's not on camera, so we can't show it to you just yet, but it does say Lewiston Strong, and that's the message that he wants this community to remember as they continue to heal, as they continue to grieve. Here's what he told me. really want it to be uh, um, a, 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 to help push Lewis in the right direction for healing properly. You know, we want to heal with unity and with strength. Yeah, helpless but hopeful, he said. Um, you know, he told me that he placed several other signs around his businesses and several uh, around town here. And, and he encourages others to start bringing flowers and cards and really show up as a sign of unity as the community here continues to grieve and mourn those lives lost. Faith. And, you know, let's stick with, you know, the victims here in, in this uh, situation. You know, there are uh, several victims who are still in the hospital this afternoon. Some are in critical care, as we learned from the top hospital official yesterday. What are we learning right now about those victims who are still recovering and what their conditions are right now? It seems that we've seen some improvement on that front. Remember yesterday there were eight people still in the hospital. Today we've learned that that is down to six with three in intensive care and three in stable condition. So it appears that two people have been discharged, whether it be the overnight hours or this morning. But we do expect to learn more perhaps on their conditions um, about the injured still recovering uh, here in the hospital during that press conference set to start any moment now, Faith. All right, of course, again, we'll bring that to you as soon as we have word that officials are at that microphone. Uh, Morgan, thank you so much. All right, breaking news right now in the Middle East. Israel Defense Forces and the IDF says it's expanding its ground operations in Gaza tonight. A military spokesperson there says the troops will be, quote, acting with great force to achieve the objectives of the war. This news coming after Israeli officials there say that Hamas launched a missile that struck an apartment building in Tel Aviv, injuring at least four people. Israeli troops also conducted a second night of raids in Gaza this week, targeting Hamas infrastructure with tanks and airstrikes. And today, White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby told ABC News the U.S. is not drawing red lines for Israel in its operation as active negotiations to 
released hostages are still ongoing. We know the death toll is rising on both sides of this conflict. Israeli officials say more than 1,400 people have been killed so far from the Hamas terror attacks earlier this month in Israel, while the Hamas-controlled health ministry reports that more than 7,000 people have been killed so far in Gaza. Meantime, though, the United Nations warning that Gaza is on the brink of collapse as its humanitarian crisis worsens by the day. Protests are continuing in support of the people in Gaza. This video you're looking at right now showing us thousands of Jordanians protesting in Amman today, calling for the termination of a peace treaty with Israel. Now, here's a live look at that Israel-Gaza border. Amid the mounting concerns that the war between Israel and Hamas will grow into a much wider conflict, ABC News Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman is on the ground in Tel Aviv. We want to talk to him about the situation happening right now. Matt, a lot has happened in the last few hours. What do we know at this hour about how Israel's ground operation is expanding in Gaza? What are you seeing and what are sources telling you there on the ground? Uh, Faith, there are things that we know and the things that we are seeing. We saw a massive bombardment from the skyline of Gaza on the Israeli side because right now all communications have been cut off inside Gaza. No internet, no phones. Unclear if it was a, an airstrike or something else. There is clearly a very significant intensification. And that's what Israel's chief military spokesman said tonight, that there is a... Um, Ground forces are expanding their operations tonight. The military is operating powerfully in all dimensions. And I got to ask Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner of the IDF uh, spokesman's office what exactly that meant. Let's take a listen. We are conducting our sweep and clear activities in order to create better conditions for operational, optimal operational conditions on the ground. Indeed, the IDF is taking the war to Hamas. We are destroying them step by step, I would say strike by strike, and that is what we intend to do by air, by land, by sea. And we have been seeing that. Um there was a massive amphibious assault yesterday overnight. Ships firing from the water. Troops on the beaches engaged in close quarter combat. What is happening tonight, though, Faith, does feel different in the fact that it was announced the way it was uh, in a major way in a nationally broadcast speech by Israel's chief military spokesman does give the indication that this is different from the overnight incursions that we've been seeing really for the past week and certainly that aerial bombardment, Faith. And of course, this news is hitting the families of hostages really hard. The IDF now claims that Hamas has at least 229 hostages at this point. Officials in Qatar are saying that they've been working to get dozens of these hostages released. So what do you know about where these negotiations stand right now? And how might this expanded ground operation that Israel is embarking on, how might that impact the negotiations here with the hostages? When that Israeli military chief Faith made that announcement tonight, Family members of the hostages were meeting Vice President Kamala Harris. At that same time, they were completely blindsided. They're very upset by this because they feel like their window is closing. Hamas has said that if Israel launches a ground incursion or an invasion of Gaza, they will call off these negotiations over the hostages. And Qatar has said that the negotiations are incredibly tenuous and sensitive. So we just don't know right now where they are, whether there's no, those negotiations are going to continue. Israel's got a little plausible deniability right now. It's not calling this an invasion of the Gaza Strip, just a stepped up series of operations. The big question right now is how Hamas takes this incursion uh, tonight, Faith. And definitely a difficult night ahead for these families. And given what's unfolding right now, uh, do we know whether Israeli forces are trying to minimize civilian casualties in Gaza? And if they are, have they explained exactly how they plan to do it? They say that they are, and they have dropped leaflets. We've seen that. They've made calls to people um, and institutions in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, which is only about 25 miles long telling them to go south, that it's safer in the south. And indeed, over a million people have been displaced, moved to the south. They believe there are about 500,000 um, people still in the northern part of Gaza that they hope would move south. They say that they're uh, more precise in their bombardments of the south of Gaza, but we have seen many people killed in those bombardments in the areas that are technically safe. The Israeli military telling me that um, sometimes they have to bomb areas where they know that there are uh, Hamas militants or leaders that they want to take out. Um, but clearly civilians are still being caught in the crossfire, even in the areas that are deemed safer, Faith. And unfortunately, the death toll keeps increasing. Thank you so much for your reporting on the ground, Matt, as Israel begins this ground invasion. 
And taking you live now to Lewiston, Maine, where officials there are holding a news conference right now on the search for the accused uh, gunman in that deadly massacre. Let's the listen real in. The primary reason I wanted to bring uh, you back in today uh, was we wanted to really identify the victims um, and uh, show their pictures. Uh, we won't get into uh, family backgrounds and, and um, their lineage at all, but we do want to show uh, those pictures, give uh, ages. I would say that uh, the families didn't want hometowns uh, listed. Uh, they do uh, certainly uh, deserve and want some privacy uh, around these issues, which makes complete sense. Uh, and uh, we're going to start with that uh, component of our information simply because that's why we're here, right? Uh, this is about the victims. Uh, that's why we do what we do, and that's why we're striving so hard, and that's why you're here, uh, because you care about them as well. So uh, we're going to go ahead and load that um, behind us here on the screen. And I think uh, Shannon Moss can also put that information out uh, following this. Some specifics here, uh, I would just like to note that the families actually uh, approved these photos, uh, sent these photos in to us uh, for a lot of different reasons. I think some of them show uh, a little of their character, a little of their relationships. Uh, and uh, some other specifics, you'll just see again, a picture, a name, uh, an age, and then there's a couple symbols there. And we wanted to be specific enough to, to what location uh, they ultimately uh, lost their lives at. Um, and again, thank the families for allowing us to even do this. They certainly didn't need to do that. Um, they're working through their own um, struggles, uh, and rightfully so. So I'm going to start with this and then uh, ask for just a, a moment of silence before we continue on uh, to our next uh, agenda item. Uh, but that uh, top left, as you see it, and that is Ronald G. Morin, 55. And I won't read uh, the venues. You can, uh, you can put that all together yourself. Uh, Peyton Brewer Ross, 40 years of age. Joshua A. Seal, 36 years of age. Brian M. McFarlane, 41 years of age. Joseph Lawrence Walker, 57. Arthur Fred Strout, 42. Max A. Hathaway, 35. Stephen M. Vozella, 45. Thomas Ryan Conrad, 34. Michael R. Deloria, the second, 51. Jason Adam Walker, 51. Tricia C. Asselin, 53. William A. Young, 44. Aaron Young, 14, his son. Robert E. Violet, 76, and his wife, Lucille M. Violet, 73. William Frank Brackett, 48 years of age. Keith D. McNair, 64. Just have a moment of silence, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, truly, truly appreciate it. And we do, again, uh, appreciate that to the family. Um, they did give us those photos. I did not, however, um, have any of the family members pronounce any of those last names, so certainly no disrespect intended if uh, in any way uh, screwed up the pronunciation. So to move on, uh, I would also like to address the numbers of the victims that we uh, that I confirmed earlier today with uh, the number eight. Uh, and I will tell you that's miscommunication on my part. I was wrong. Uh, in talking to our detectives, uh, we had uh, a list for people that had been identified and family members that had been notified. It's also a separate list that involved uh, family advocacy and whether or not they had been plugged into that. So the reality here is that all 18 
of those victims, everybody that we listed here today, everybody has been identified and their families have been notified. So we were in contact with them. I would expect some more information uh, later tonight and um, I'll definitely talk about it tomorrow morning at 10, a uh, reference to uh, Family Information Center, a new location and some material around that, exactly what services will be available uh, at that particular time. But I definitely wanted to make sure that I correct uh, that mistake uh, from earlier. So several other updates um, from uh, this morning's briefing. I know that uh, Shannon has sent along the aerial maps uh, that we showed uh, or tried to show here on the board, uh, so you have received those. Uh, I also think that we had, uh, and Shannon has corrected this as well, but the Pajeb Scott boat ramp, the proper name there was the Paper Mills Trail and Miller Park boat launch. The address was correct at 501 Lisbon Street. The jump scott is a little bit further down uh, the river, apparently, and we certainly like uh, and appreciate everybody uh, working with us to make sure that we had the, the proper location, the proper terminology uh, for that. Uh, and other additional uh, updates, the boat launch search uh, of the river, the Androscoggin, they're still out there uh, right now, and they'll be there as long as they can uh, based on the light. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, we're talking about sonars and grid searches and things of that nature. That's time intensive. It's taken them a while to work through there. They want to make sure they do it right. Um, so we're not going to finish that search this evening. I would be surprised if you ever saw divers in the water overall. Uh, but tomorrow we'll have additional dive resources available to us uh, from out of state as well as some additional in-state teams. Um, so again, we'll discuss that a little bit at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, but no surprises. We expect that to go over and uh, that we'll have some assets there tomorrow. They did a bunch of flyovers this morning, as I mentioned. They did the sonar searches, some side, some ROV, um, and uh, we'll be back on that tomorrow. The, the bar scene itself, um, they continue to do uh, their uh, on-scene investigation there as well as at the bowling alley. Uh, they did check those wood lines. Uh, they may be back in there tomorrow as well, uh, but that is progressing as expected. And I think uh, another major piece uh, of updates uh, for you uh, now is to talk about the shelter in place order and where that's going uh, effective immediately. Uh, and I'm, I'm not a big reader of orders, but I think this is important that you hear this directly from um, a couple different sources. We're going to put out a release. There's going to be a cell phone uh, geofence release to some folks. Uh, we've used that a couple times already uh, during the active shooter as a warning and otherwise. But the shelter in place order is rescinded, except hunting is prohibited in the towns of Lewiston, Lisbon, Bowdoin, and Monmouth beginning Saturday, 10 28 24, until further notice. The state police continue to search in Lewiston, Lisbon, Bowdoin, and Monmouth for the suspect, Robert Card, and recommend individuals remain vigilant. Businesses may choose to open or remain closed. Uh, Commissioner Camuso from IFNW is here to help us answer any additional questions about that hunting piece. Um, it was asked this morning, uh, and it was a good question, and I told you at that time that we were working on an answer for that. Uh, and what that means is that uh, the general shelter in place has been rescinded. Specifically, hunting, again, is prohibited in those four towns and those four towns only. And it's important that I mention that because the rest of the state is allowed to continue with their resident only day uh, on Saturday, tomorrow. And what does that mean? That means that there are going to be communities that hear gunshots from time to time because they're going to be hunting. Um, so we would ask everybody to use caution in that and not think that every one of those gunshots is directly uh, regarding this particular crisis situation, this investigation. So clearly, if they think, if they're suspicious, if they're concerned, they can certainly call their local agencies. But I would ask them to think about that, where they're located, um, when do they hear that, if they're 150 miles north, do they need to call their 911 center and, and create a response? Um, and I think I would say no to that unless they have another set of facts, a fact pattern that would believe them that there's a direct connection between that gunfire and what they've heard uh, to this point. So we had mentioned why we made that decision initially because of the crisis and the situation that we had. Uh, those four towns in, in particular, clearly with Lewiston uh, and the two uh, tragic situations here, the two locations we already talked about, 
Uh, and then you have Lisbon, Lisbon with a boat launch, Bowdoin where the suspect live. In Monmouth, there's other family connections in that particular area as well. So this is not to say um, that uh, the crisis is over, the emergency is done, uh, we can go about our lives as life is good. We want our folks, we want our residents to remain vigilant and to pay attention to what we, what we share for information. I again focus on what we share is in the Department of Public Safety in the city of Lewiston, uh, because we continue to see a lot of information from a lot of different places uh, that is far from accurate. I would also say in that regard, um, when we say that we're gonna meet you here at 10, we're gonna meet you here at 10, and when we say we're gonna notify you, we are gonna notify you in the afternoon if we're gonna get together and what time that is, um, I just encourage you to, to believe that until I prove you wrong. Uh, and I won't. Uh, and I say that because we've heard some other stuff. There's going to be a press conference at 1 o'clock. Um, and then our PIO, who's incredibly busy, gets 100 emails and says, is it going to be 1 o'clock or is it going to be this? Uh, and you've got a job to do. I get it. And we're trying to help you do your job. And if you could help us do our job, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. So that is uh, some of those uh, pieces for updates from what we uh, worked on this morning. A couple of additional things, um, neighborhood canvases as an example, I did not speak to that. Uh, so we talked about large um, deployments of officers in various locations, what would that look like? Um, neighborhood canvases could be a couple of officers knocking on a door. And uh, that's going to be happening at various locations uh, around this particular area in multiple towns. Again. If somebody's using their own uh, common sense and they say that doesn't seem right, then sure, call. Uh, but you could have two uniformed officers or two officers with clearly displayed badges jumping out of a marked car to come talk to you as detectives. There was a question this morning around arrival times at the two locations, and we had done some research uh, on that, uh, which was hot off the presses uh, walking out the door to come here today. Uh, so spare time. As we had mentioned earlier, that initial 911 call was uh, occurred at 6.56 p.m. And by the CAD system or the computer-aided dispatch system, so somebody calls in on a radio and they says, now I'm out at that location. The first officer, the first Lewiston officer arrived based on that system at 7 p.m., so four minutes later. The reality there, however, is that there were four plainclothes police officers that were shooting on the range in that general area. They hear that call come in, and they're walking into the into the bar, and uh, or rather the bowling alley, in about a minute and a half. Um, so they don't have radios. They weren't in uniform. They hear it as they're at the range. They respond to the address immediately, and then they address the threat and, and clear the building. For that same location, right, spare time, as an example, you have Lewiston. It's a self-contained police department. They work with everybody, so it's not uncommon to see the main state police in town, but they don't have specific areas to patrol. Calls came in to dispatch centers for the Department of Public Safety that would control uh, the Maine State Police, as an example, at 6.57, so a minute-ish later. And we didn't have necessarily troopers right inside the town, so 11 minutes later, our first trooper arrives, which is not uncommon, actually, and that's a pretty good response time, considering it's an urban atmosphere and troopers aren't here. The second set of calls, as we've discussed, came in at 7.08. So this is the bar and grill. And the first Lewiston order officer is responding there at 19.13 or 7.13 p.m., so five minutes later. And then, really, it becomes exponential after that, as an example. Um, should have mentioned this earlier, but spare time, uh, a minute after those initial officers respond, eight more are there. Like now we're saying now everybody's starting to roll in about the same time, and about 10 officers are responding to the bar and grill immediately thereafter. You got the first folks, and then people are just showing up from the police department and other locations. And that particular uh, call for service for the Maine State Police through Department of Public Safety dispatches, we got that second call at uh, 710, about two minutes later than the Lewiston Center received it, and we had officers responding and arriving three minutes later. So why is that? They're already flying to the first address, and now we got a second call, and now they're diverting to that second call. So it's obviously going to, they're in town, uh, and they're running hard to that location. So those are the arrival times um, that I was asked about earlier today. I think based on uh, the list that I made this morning, I think that's all we had for information. Um, and I'll just call that kind of updates and follow-ups, things that uh, I knew you were asking. There were some additional questions from the general public 
um, which has been good for us to receive those through these, right? They get a chance to see stuff and then they reach out and say, what does this mean? We had a, a bunch of people reach out about that shelter in place and what does that mean and what should I do and what does that look like? Um, and rather than answer those uh, through conversations with city staff, city leadership, um, police chiefs, we decided to rescind that order again, um, but recommend that people remain vigilant as they move forward. So I do appreciate them reaching out, and uh, all of that contact has something to do with our ultimate decision. You know, where do we go from here? So with that in mind, um, that's the information that I was asked uh, and, and the information that I can update. Uh, we do have, I believe, the suspect picture up here as, a, as another uh, as another piece. And the reason that we did this is because it's been quite some time. We've seen that photo, and you have a bunch of different photos. This, in fact, has more of the physical description of his height and weight um, and his more official hair and eye color. Um, you could guess at that based on some of the photos that you see, but why do that if we can directly uh, give you that information? So if you could freshen up any uh, material that you have there, uh, it, it does again show that brown hooded sweatshirt and dark colored cargo pants that are in the photo that we had released earlier, which showed him walking in uh, to spare time uh, with that firearm. So I think that's the information that I wanted to, to get out to you today. I appreciate you coming back or holding on. I know you, you have long days and long nights. Um, so that piece, uh, you were going to be around anyway, I'm sure. But I am, again, happy to try to take some questions and answers. Uh, the chief is here as well. Uh, but we did want to keep this tight as an, from an operational standpoint. So, so yes, sir. Go back to the timeline. Yeah. So four officers were at the range, right? So can you just go over that again? Just like yeah, sure. So. Officers are required to, to qualify a certain number of times a year, right? So in this particular instance, uh, the officers are in plain clothes. They're shooting out of range right around the corner. The call comes in. They hear that, and they're going to respond, which just speaks to when these things happen, everybody's going. You could be a detective. The chief's bailing out of the station. You could be wherever. Everybody goes. So being Lewiston officers, they go, That's we know where that is. Everybody gets in the car, and they immediately go uh, to spare time, to, to help in any way they can, not knowing that, in fact, they're going to be the closest there and the first out. So that cuts almost two and a half minutes off the original or the initial uh, uniform police officer's response. And that's not uncommon from a police standpoint. Sometimes you got months where you're thinking, boy, I'm right around the corner when all this stuff happens. And sometimes there's, I'm on the other side of the city when other stuff happens. We're very, very lucky that the officers were that close because I think you save lives with time responses. Um, and in an urban atmosphere, depending on where everybody is and how busy the night is, um, that response could have been much longer than that. Sir, yes, sir. Have there been any credible sightings of the suspect by either law enforcement or the public? since the shooting took place? Yeah, so we have, again, uh, 530 plus uh, tips and leads that have come in. Um, some of those have been citing, some of those have been, um, it, and I would say as simple as, but hey, I've got a, a vacant house that's in this location. I own a barn that I'm afraid to go to. Uh, there's something over here that concerns me. So those things run the gamut. Um, and I'm also going to use that opportunity to st the FBI supervisory agent in charge, uh, Jody Cohen, who has been uh, with us during these press conferences. We gave that digital video information out this morning. There's already well over 100 entries in that system. So that means you're putting that information out, and the general public is grabbing hold of that, wanting to be involved, and sending that information in. Uh, so I thank you for that, and we certainly thank the FBI for their assistance with that kind of material. So we've got all kinds of, if somebody may say, somebody. Has law enforcement seen him in the last two days? Uh, we have not. Uh, law enforcement has not seen him in the last uh, two days. Uh, but again, in that stack of that 500 plus, you may have somebody that says, hey, we see somebody that looks like that. Um, so we have not. But go ahead, ma'am. Can you confirm that the known clown that says that's home is a suicide note? Does that have something to do with him doing yeah, I cannot, and I'm not going to speak to the to the note itself. Uh, I acknowledge the fact that a note existed this morning, but I'm not going to get into exactly what it contained. But, sir? Uh, sir, you said that the officers, the plain clothes officers who responded, uh, addressed the threat, cleared the building. Can you explain what happened there? Sure. When I say address the threat, they're going in the door 
uh, addressing an active shooter. So they're going in uh, prepared to do whatever they need to do uh, to make that scene safe. On that particular time, the suspect is no longer there. They're going in as if they were. So the first thing you do is you go in and clear that uh, location, make sure it's safe, and then you start working with victims and triaging people and trying to make sure that you're getting additional units uh, there as fast as possible. So, yes, sir. Um, I wonder if when the officers arrived at the second scene, the suspect was still there, or whether by the time the first responders had arrived, if the suspects had already left. And secondly to that, outside of the uh, area of Lewiston and the surrounding communities, can you talk about the work that's going on further afield, you know, the, the suspicion that we might have been able to flee a bit further than that, potentially even outside of the setting? Yeah, sure. So uh, the suspect was not at the second location when the officers arrived. Um, as we discussed this morning, we showed those three maps as specific areas we, we knew we were definitely going to be working in. Uh, and then we've also cleared other, other areas that are farther afield. Somebody may again say, you know, there's a barn over there, there's an outbuilding over there, um, there's some family property that somebody's uncle owns, and can you check that? So as those things come in, some of those are kind of on the checklist to begin with, and then some come in real time. Because as those leads come in, we do look at those and then we farm them back out to either tactical units that are looking on that apprehension side or investigative units that can go out and do additional interviews. Is it possible that we could have gone outside the state? Well, at this point, uh, you know, we are cognizant of all possibilities. Uh, we're not closing off anything um, because we want to make sure that we're being uh, as comprehensive as we can with these particular searches. Yes, ma'am? Um, we noticed earlier there was in what town? Uh, Durham. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, and uh, that's a that's a situation where uh, we did. I heard that on the radio. Somebody had reached out to say that they may somebody may ask that question today. So we did look at that. There was a location there um, on a on a street in Durham uh, where there were two 911 hang up calls. 911 hang up calls happen on a regular basis, depending on where they are. You may go, okay, wait a second. And then we had a second call. And then there was a sheriff's deputy that responded to the scene and then ultimately did not answer their radio. Right? So you go 911 hang up, 911 hang up, okay, wait a second. The officer that responded is not talking. That could be for a lot of different reasons. Again, based on the circumstances, we're certainly concerned about something like that. So officers did respond, make sure uh, that he was safe, the scene was safe, and they moved on. So there was no uh, direct connection to the suspect in this scenario, um, at least in today's call for service. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I, uh, have you at this point uh, secured or gone to all the residents Every place that where he was, where he had lived previously, have you gone to each one of those homes? And additionally, at this point, have you executed all available search warrants? Search warrants at the houses, at his yep. car, social media, electronics. Like, have you put have you put all of those search warrants in, or, or there's still others? That you there's still a lot of work to be done around the search warrant side of the house just based on workload alone. I don't know, however, you know, have we searched every house that he's had over the last amount of time? Certainly the ones that most recent. Um, there's a Bowdoin connection, which uh, caused a bit of a stir last night. That was a location we were concerned about. You know, our reality from a uh, homicide investigation, as an example, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you may have done one or two search warrants. Based on electronic devices and everything else, you could do up to 30 search warrants on one. So this kind of situation, clearly there's going to be a lot of affidavits, a lot of work to be done uh, around that. Um, so we're working with the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Attorney General's Office, federal entities are assisting with these warrants. Um, that's an all hands on deck. You just never know, I'm going to open this device and that's going to be, that's going to be the one, right? So we farm that out to make sure we're making as much progress as possible. And I'm sorry for waiting. Go ahead. Yeah, no in the area, mm -hmm. how is that going to complicate the search, or are you hoping that it actually might help investigators and be a problem for your suspect? Yeah, so I think that that goes in two different directions, right? We certainly have a lot of resources coming for the river tomorrow, because it would be nicer if it's sunnier, you can get a better, uh, better look into the water. Um, so that's one angle. If it's colder, there's, a, a, there's an argument to be made that um, your thermo uh, style of equipment where you're looking for body temperatures or heat signatures may work better in that sense. Scenario, um, so it does definitely vary. If it's cold for the suspect, it's certainly cold for our officers as well, and all those different things. Uh, we're certainly prepared and, and willing to do all those things, but um, but that's where we're at. So yes, sir. Discuss some of the reasoning behind why you removed the shelter-in-place orders in these four mm -hmm. towns where you acknowledged you're still actively searching. 
And secondly, do we know how many weapons Card had or has? The, the second question is no, I don't know uh, how many uh, he has or had. Um, if there are weapons within that residence, that'll be part of the search warrant and counting those things out. Um, and the, the decision to release that or rescind that uh, shelter in place order is something that we've discussed uh, internally as uh, command staff members at the CP and saying, okay, we're looking at pros and cons, right? We've got communities that are locked down, that are shut down. Um, there are families and schools and pharmacies and all those things. So we knew going in and have acknowledged that repeatedly that we know that that can have a negative impact on people. So the other side of that is we had very pointed threats early on reference to these locations and nothing specific since then. So you have to look at that and you have to do the math on that and say, so are we more comfortable? Are we doing more harm than good by keeping people away from these clinics and their doctors and in schools? And while this is still a, absolutely a dangerous situation without question, um, we've got to make recommendations and ask the people that we serve, ask the people that we protect to be vigilant, to pay attention, to listen to what we have to say. If you see something, say something. Because you know in most cases you're like, I don't like that. That looks strange. We, we can feel that, uh, especially when you live in neighborhoods, right? You, that you live there, you, you're comfortable with that. That deal, that car is wrong coming down my driveway at this particular time of the day. What is going on? So um, th that we don't come to those decisions to go into the order or come out lightly uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But we do appreciate all the input from everybody uh, about what does that mean and how it's impacted me as a person, right? So I appreciate that. Yes, sir. All possibilities are open to us. Uh, I don't have anything specific reference to that particular question. The next steps, where did he go after that and what was he in or not? Um, which is why uh, we have uh, feelers out in all directions. Is that a possibility? Sure. Um, is the river a possibility? Sure. We're going to continue uh, to work those things until we're comfortable that uh, those things um, have, have mitigated to the best of our ability, right? Because some of these locations we serve a search warrant on doesn't mean we're done, right? We may actually go back and continue a search um, and new information and go back and check an, a location again. Uh, so all of those things are absolutely available. Sir, right here. Are there now 18 that, That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. I know that the Attorney General's uh, office told us this afternoon uh, that they were trying to, to complete the rest of those warrants in a timely fashion. Uh, now that those individuals were, had been identified and the families notified. Um, I'll have that answer for you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for sure. And right here, ma'am, sorry. Yes, thank you. two questions. Um, the first is whether you can confirm that police found a gun in Card's car, the one that the suspect's car, the one that was discarded. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what communication has been like with law enforcement and other on the border states of uh, Canada, New Hampshire, even Massachusetts, and specifically whether or not uh, there will <coughs> there's any expectation or any plan to put the border checks in place um, as a suspect continues to potentially be moving. Yeah, sure. So, um, so we won't speak to, to evidence, specific evidence. Did you find something here? Did you find something there? I completely understand why the question is valid, uh, but it's not something we're prepared to talk about, certainly this early on in an investigation. Um, I can tell you that I've been in contact with all of our border states or country. Um, New Brunswick reached out to the governor. The commissioners from our border states reached out to me immediately the day of and have reached out to me multiple times since then. Um, again, a lot of their officers are with us at this point, right? New Hampshire is up here, Massachusetts is up here, you name it on the federal side of the house, they are here. Um, so everybody's really working hard on that side of it. I, there's no uh, expectation at all that there's going to be some kind of a border checkpoint scenario. But I'm going to take one more call, one more uh, question here from, from you, ma'am. Question for the chief. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Um, it's been very difficult, I can tell you that for certain. Um, <clears throat> seeing these pictures come up on the, on the board, um, I know a couple of them myself. Um, there are many law enforcement officials that I know know some of these victims, and it's certainly very challenging. Um, you know, try to go into a, a situation very objectively and, um, you know, do a very thorough job knowing that you know this person that it's affected or, you know, a family member or a friend. Very difficult. Um, I can tell you that 
all of the police officers I know from the area remain very uh, professional at all times. Um, and, we, and we press on and we get the job done. Yeah, again, I can't, the state police has the lead on this investigation. I can't comment on that. I can tell you that in, in scenes that I've investigated personally or that I've been to, um, it happens a lot. It, it takes a long time to process these scenes. It, it's nothing that happens in a quick manner, like, like uh, Mike mentioned earlier this morning. It doesn't happen in an hour and the case is solved. Um, these things take time. I'm not prepared to answer that question, but uh, I do appreciate that. And, and as I mentioned, uh, thank you very much for being here. We really do appreciate that. And we'll continue to uh, strengthen this partnership and get out as much information as we can. So have a nice evening. Thank you. 10 o'clock tomorrow. A good afternoon to you, everyone. Thanks for today. staying with us here on ABC News Live. You've just been watching law enforcement officials in Lewiston, Maine, giving us an update on that mass shooting that happened as we approach 48 hours since that mass shooting. The search for the suspect still continues this evening. But we just learned some new details. Officials say they've now identified all 18 victims who passed away after that shooting. They've notified their families. The victims range in age from 14 years old to 76 years old. Uh, authorities were able to get photographs from their family members showing these victims uh, and basically showing their character according, according to what the police chief said, humanizing them, the photos showing them smiling, doing what they love. Again, as that search for the suspect continues, police, the police chief making sure that these victims are not forgotten and that they are honored. Uh, for more on this, we want to bring in ABC's Morgan Norwood, who's live in Lewiston, Maine right now, as well as our ABC News contributor and former FBI agent Brett Garrett to talk more about what we just heard there. Morgan, I want to start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what stood out to you. Uh, we got a little bit more details than we got earlier this morning when authorities gave that first update. Yeah, you know, I think you mentioned it right off the top, that big headline coming out of the press conference is that all 18 victims have been identified. Faith, they age, and age from an age from 14 to 76. They ended, of course, with the reading of the names and that moment of silence that really um, kind of gripped me there. Um, they talked about the boat launch, that search still ongoing. That aspect is still pretty intensive. Um, not finishing that search this evening, but certainly going to bring in more dive teams from neighboring states uh, to continue that tomorrow. Remember, this location is critical because that's one of the last known areas where the suspect possibly might have been. Uh, that abandoned Subaru was left there at the boat lodge. Uh, officials said and had concern that he might have had access to a boat, that escape route using the waterways. I think the major update um, that, com that came out of that press conference is that the shelter-in-place order has been rescinded. Rescinded beginning, beginning uh, tomorrow morning, but hunting is prohibited in four towns. Still, they are asking the community here to remain vigilant. But outside of that community, it's not under that hunting uh, order. They're asking residents just to be mindful of that if they hear gunshots. Um, you know, also we're hearing about that timeline, that response, you know, multiple police officers responding in within four uh, to five minutes of those 911 calls at both of those locations. Um, you know, also what stood out to me is that apparently multiple police officers, a handful of them were shooting at a gun range nearby. They were off duty at the time, just trying to get it in those hours for certification and they hear the gunshots from the bowling alley and they immediately respond. So talk about the humanity, the compassion and that swift response from both officers on the clock and officers off duty. Um, we also got an update on, you know, just the hundreds of tips that have been coming in th thus far. They say that no sightings from law enforcement, but of course residents are reporting uh, you know, potential sightings from tips, you know, things and other leads, you know, telling them to check sheds, you know, abandoned properties, things like that. To that end, uh, they ended the press conference or towards the end of the press conference, they showed an updated photo of Robert Card. Um, you know, they wanted to make sure that the public had the most updated information uh, showing his facial hair, his eye color, um, his facial, facial features. You can really see that really clearly, but the press conference also ended uh, we heard from an officer who responded to the scene who talked about uh, the toll that it took on him as well, seeing community members, the faces of community members that he knew personally um, and having to respond to that. So it was a very detailed press conference, several big headlines coming out of all of this. Uh, but again, the, the other big headline is that the suspect is still out there. And this is a still uh, an extensive and exhaustive search. Faith. 
Yeah, and I just want to pick up on that uh, and, and talk to Brad about that just a little bit here. Brad, anything you heard from this press conference leading you to think that they're closing in on the suspect at this point? No. I mean, everything I heard is interesting, but, you know, they really talked in, in generalities. I mean, they're, they're making a presumption. Now, obviously, they know a lot more than the three of us know. But they're, they, you know, they're making a big presumption based on dive teams, et cetera, that water and a boat are relevant. And I'm not suggesting otherwise, but it's those type of leads burn up a lot of time, money, uh, manpower, et cetera. You have to do them. Um, but it doesn't sound like to me they are any closer. They're doing their best. I've been stuck in cases exactly the same way, high profile cases. You don't really have hot specific leads. A lead like, for example, that Mr. Card, you know, just walked out of a house at 123 Elm Street. You know, they can react to that and perhaps catch him. It's figuring out where he is in real time. And that's always a tricky situation in these cases. And of course, the wild card is that he's dead and he's in a location someplace. I mean, there is a suicide note. You can't take that on its face that he actually is deceased at this point, but it also does go with mass shooters because mass shooters basically are committing suicide. Most of them die at the scene or shoot themselves. So uh, I, I, I think we're not any further down the road as far as exactly where Mr. Card might be, whether he's dead or alive. Um, but you have to be persistent. If those 500 plus leads, there might be something stuck in there that take them to a particular location. And I want to bring in Richard Frankel, our ABC News contributor and former FBI special agent in charge. Uh, Rich, you, you also were listening to this uh, conversation and, and this news conference here. Uh, this manhunt is still very much underway, as you just heard from Brad there. As it expands, where could this lead investigators to in terms of, you know, where do we go from here? It seems they don't have a specific lead that they're following that's going to get them closer to uh, the suspect at this point, but they are following all the leads that are coming in as credible as uh, you know they, they can parse it out to be yeah they're, they're gonna have to follow every lead that comes in I mean this is you know uh, you know tried and true it's the oh, it, it, this is you know old police work when you're doing a manhunt um, you know the FBI has brought in the new technology Jody uh, Cohen who's a special agent in charge in Boston uh, um, brought forward a uh, um, an online ability to uh, for the public to bring leads and see something, say something. Um, the officers are getting other leads uh, from other things that they find as they're doing these searches. Uh, they may get stuff off the phone that gives them other leads, but basically they're doing an expanded search out. It, it's um, many pronged. They're gonna be looking, of course, in the Lewiston area, in the Lisbon area. They're gonna have to go out on the boat. They're gonna have to view the coastline because of where the um, uh, uh, they believe he left his car um, and that he may have gotten into a boat, they're gonna have to go out into the um, uh, uh, mountainous areas of Maine to look for him because you know he may have had another car standing by. Um, they're gonna have to go into the cities of Maine, maybe into Portland or Bangor, because maybe he's trying to hide you know, uh, hide in public, so to speak, you know, just be another person walking down the street in one of those cities. So they really are just gonna have to keep you know, going after each and every lead, the see something, say something leads, the leads that are out there um, from, uh, you know, the technology, the social media exploitation leads, all of these are going to have to be run down um, and not leave any of them um, unchecked because until they find him, um, it's an open investigation and you have an armed and dangerous person who is out there that has to be tracked down and brought to justice. And Brad, just real quickly, I just found it interesting, just based on what Rich just said, you know, that shelter in place order has now been lifted in, in that community, even though they have some restrictions when it comes to hunting. So with this, you know, suspect still on the run, armed and dangerous, why do you think they've decided to lift that shelter in place order? Because they don't think he's in the proximity of the areas that were restricted. Uh, and so it makes complete sense to, you know, lift these restrictions. So, 
it is a bit of a telling statement. I, I don't know that it's particularly positive as far as where this guy might be. Yeah. Well, Brad, Rich, and Morgan, thank you so much for your input and, of course, discussing this with us. We'll continue updating our viewers here as we get more details on this search for that suspect in the mass shooting in Maine. All right, coming up for us here, we're learning more about the IDF's expanded ground operation in Gaza, the latest from Jerusalem, and new details from the Pentagon straight ahead. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Now to our breaking news right here on ABC News Live. The breaking news in the Middle East. Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, says it's expanding its ground operations in Gaza tonight. A military spokesperson there saying the troops will be, quote, acting with great force to achieve the objectives of the war. This news coming after Israeli authorities there say Hamas launched a missile that struck an apartment building in Tel Aviv, injuring at least four people. Israeli troops also conducted a second night of raids in Gaza this week, targeting Hamas infrastructure with tanks and airstrikes. And today, White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said the U.S. is not drawing red lines for Israel in its operation and that the active negotiations for the release of the hostages were still ongoing at this point. We know the death toll is rising on both sides of this conflict. Officials in Israel say more than 1,400 people have been killed so far from the Hamas terror attacks that happened earlier this month in Israel. While the Hamas-controlled health ministry reports more than 7,000 people have been killed in Gaza so far from Israeli airstrikes. Meantime, the United Nations warning that Gaza is on the brink of collapse as the humanitarian crisis there worsens by the day. Protests are continuing to support the people of Gaza. This video you're looking at here showing us thousands of Jordanians protesting in Amman today, calling for the termination of a peace treaty with Israel. Here's a live look at the Israel-Gaza border amid mounting concerns that the war between Israel and Hamas will continue to grow and grow into a much wider conflict. For more on the reporting on the ground, we want to bring in our ABC News, Inez de la Qatara uh, from Jerusalem. Inez, thank you so much for joining us. I just want you to describe to us what you are seeing there, but also what you're hearing from officials and your sources about this expanded ground operation in Gaza tonight. 
Hey, Faith, yeah, so the IDF saying they are expanding their ground operation, and this comes as we are also seeing intensifying airstrikes on Gaza. The IDF talking about how they were going to be ramping up their airstrikes, and we've been watching those live pictures coming of the Gaza Strip, and it's been explosion after explosion there. Those explosions do seem to be concentrated in the north of the Gaza Strip, um, and this latest wave does appear to be the worst, uh, you know, amount of airstrikes we've seen since the war began. Now, this all comes as we have seen also limited incursions being conducted in the Gaza Strip over the last couple of days. The, there were some raids conducted overnight last night uh, that were uh, via sea. And we know that the IDF had repeatedly said that this war would be raged, waged in uh, different phases. The first phase being attacks by land, by air, by sea. The second phase being a ground incursion. We are not yet sure if this is that big invasion that we've been waiting for. Certainly the signs are there. The fact that they are ramping up airstrikes. The fact that we now know that uh, all communications have been lost uh, in the Gaza Strip. No internet, no phones. Um, that's another possible sign of this being a, a more significant operation. Um, and the fact that they themselves are saying that they are expanding the ground operation. So we'll have to see. Um, but but certainly, you know, I think probably a terrifying situation for, for residents there in Gaza, especially as they now have no way of communicating with the outside world. Hey, I just want to hone in on what you just said there about the communication being cut off there. A lot of the humanitarian groups, uh, the aid groups that are on the ground are saying that they've lost contact with uh, some of their staff members there. What does this mean for the people there in Gaza with no you know, phone service and no internet service? Yeah, so we're learning for, from uh, the UN, for instance, UNICEF. We are hearing from uh, Doctors Without Borders. I mean, a, a number of aid groups that are saying they have lost contact with their staff on the ground. We have been relying on people's accounts inside of Gaza to really know what is happening inside of Gaza because, of course, we can't get in, people can't get out. And so that's been the only way to really know what's happening on the ground is to be in contact with these people. ABC News has been following the stories of several people in Gaza as they were evacuating from the north to the south. And so, yeah, lots of concerns for, for those people, lots of concerns as to just what's going to happen on the ground um, if these people are no longer able to share their story with the world. Also worth pointing out that um, this all comes as there had been talks of a possible ceasefire. So we saw growing calls for a ceasefire to be implemented. There were reports that uh, negotiations there were advancing, but the Israelis earlier today did shoot that down. They said uh, it might be in Hamas's interest to negotiate a, a ceasefire, uh, that it's not an option for them, that they would not negotiate negotiate with terrorists and they kind of ask the rhetorical question would you negotiate with ISIS of course we're certainly watching as this continues to develop and as thank you so much for your reporting all right, so for more on this, on an analysis on the Israel-Hamas war, we want to turn to ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, who is at the Pentagon for us. We also have ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy with us. Uh, Louis, I want to start with you about what we know or what you're hearing uh, from the Pentagon here about the ground operation, this expanded ground operation, and how it changes this war. Well, Faith, one of the things we're hearing here is that the Pentagon officials are monitoring the situation as it is occurring in Gaza right now. Um, but one of the things that they're looking at is to see exactly what it is that the Israelis will be conducting as part of this ground incursion. Uh, ABC's Martha Raddatz has spoken with a senior U.S. official who says that this is probably a limited incursion that we're seeing right now. Um, I've talked with other officials who have said that what we have seen over the last couple of nights with these ground raids um, may be changing. So maybe this is something that indicates that they are shifting how they're operating. And Mick, there's a major concern tonight for the hostages who are still there in Gaza. The humanitarian crisis there impacting the civilians there. Does this expanded operation really make things more challenging? So Faith, it does. I mean, we would hope that all the hostages could get out through diplomacy, uh, but it doesn't look like it's gonna happen. And quite frankly, Hamas, probably would never have let it happen because they're going to use them as shields. They're going to put them in the tunnels and it's going to make the tunnels an incredibly difficult problem for the IDF when they actually get on the ground uh, in large numbers. And of course, we're all watching to see what happens in the overnight hours. Uh, Louis and Mick, thank you so much for joining us. We uh, appreciate your perspective. 
All right, thank you guys for streaming with us here on ABC News Live. I'm Faith Abube. Make sure you follow us uh, live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. We have updates running all day on all of those platforms. Also coming up tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact they have on you. All of that coming up at 7 p.m. tonight. The news never stops, and neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. Tonight, the victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hello to you, I'm Faith Abube. Thanks for joining us here on ABC News Live. We begin with breaking news in the Middle East. Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, says it's expanding its ground operations in Gaza tonight. A military spokesperson there saying the troops will be, quote, acting with great force to achieve the objectives of the war. This news coming after Israeli authorities say Hamas launched a missile that struck an apartment building in Tel Aviv, injuring at least four people. Israeli troops also conducted a second night of raids in Gaza this week, targeting Hamas infrastructure and tanks and airstrikes. And today, White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said, the U.S. is not drawing red lines for Israel in its operations as active negotiations to release hostages are still ongoing. We know the death toll is rising on both sides of this conflict at this point. Officials in Israel say more than 1,400 people have been killed from the Hamas terror attacks that happened earlier this month in Israel. While the Hamas-controlled health ministry reports more than 7,000 people people have been killed so far in Gaza from Israeli airstrikes. Meantime, the United Nations warning that Gaza is on the brink of collapse as its humanitarian crisis worsens by the day. Protests are continuing in support of the people in Gaza. This video showing you thousands of Jordanians protesting in Amman today, calling for the termination of a peace treaty with Israel. Let's take you live now uh, to the Israeli-Gaza border. You see the live picture there, mounting concerns tonight as the war continues and intensifies. Concerns about whether this will become a wider conflict and grow into a wider conflict. ABC News' Inez de la Cotera joins me now from Jerusalem to talk more about this expanded ground operation that is happening tonight, according to Israeli forces. Uh, Israel, uh, Inez, I, I just want to talk about the, the family members right now. You know, the American hostages who are being held in Gaza, they met with uh, Vice President Kamala Harris tonight. What is this latest development, this ground operation, this expanded ground operation that uh, the IDF announced? What does this mean for these hostages and their safety? 
Yeah, lots of concerns about what this could mean for those hostages. So we do know that the families of some of these American hostages uh, met with the Vice President Kamala Harris today. We know a representative for these families says they were not informed of this expanded ground incursion. But we know that the fact that there are hostages inside of Gaza has complicated this whole situation. It is part of the reason that the IDF appeared to be delaying its big ground invasion. And we should be clear that we're not sure that what's happening right now is this big ground invasion uh, that we've been waiting for. Um, but certainly the fact that there were hostages in Gaza complicated things. We know that uh, there, there, we had reporting that the U.S. was uh, asking privately for uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to delay the ground invasion so as to buy more time to negotiate these hostages release. We've seen protests here around Israel, families of the hostages uh, calling for the ground invasion to be delayed, worried about the safety of their hostages. So, um, you know, unclear if what we're seeing now, if it's if it is this big ground invasion or if it's a more limited incursion. Uh, a uh, senior U.S. official telling our Martha Raddatz that that is the case, that this is the Israelis launching a limited uh, incursion. And if that's the case, then the big question is, is this the Israelis kind of changing their strategy here because of the hostages? Are they going to decide to just go in and, and conduct these small raids that we've been seeing, you know, conducted over the last few days? Or is this really this big ground invasion? Unclear. But yeah, lots of concerns for those hostages. And of course, Israel has been adamant that this is about destroying Hamas. Uh, we heard from the White House today that, you know, the remarks about not drawing red lines for Israel, all of this, of course, happening uh, as we, this news is happening this afternoon, uh, this expanded ground invasion or ground, uh, uh, expanded ground operation, uh, according to the IDF. Now, have you been hearing any reaction uh, to all of this from the Arab world, the leaders in the neighboring countries there? Yeah, we're starting to see some protests or calls for protests already, specifically in Jordan. And you mentioned it off the top there. We saw thousands taking to the streets there earlier today. And there were calls uh, specifically in Jordan uh, for protests to be held outside of the Israeli embassy. We've seen across the Arab world lots of reaction to the strikes on Gaza. And we should point out uh, that the IDF is also ramping up its airstrikes on Gaza tonight, in addition to this expanded ground operation. And so lots of concerns for the civilians of Gaza. We also know that the civilians have now officially lost communications. A number of aid uh, groups are saying that they have lost contact with their workers on the ground in Gaza. And so you can imagine the situation that civilians now find themselves in, uh, just hearing these these airstrikes and these explosions and not being able to really know what's going on. Um, you know, people in Gaza we had been speaking with in, in recent days had, had already talked about how it was difficult to access the news and to know what was going on because of the siege that's being laid to Gaza, the fact that there's no uh, electricity, no fuel. Um, but now they've, they've you know, officially cut um, uh, comms, so so no internet, no no phone services, um, and so I think we are going to see reaction there in, in the Arab world in the coming days. Uh, people, you know, uh, uh, protesting these these ramped up airstrikes, the uh, expanded ground operation, and the fact that civilians can no longer share their story with the outside world. And for now, so a long night for so many in that region. Ines, thank you so much for your reporting. All right, so for more now on the Israel-Hamas war, I want to bring in ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, who's at the Pentagon for us, and ABC News national security and defense analyst uh, Mick Mulroy. And Louis, I just want to start with you about what your sources are telling you. I know the Pentagon is getting this, you know, uh, wide view of what's going on. They're letting the Israeli forces uh, basically decide what they want and not getting you know, personally involved there. But what are they telling you right now about this expanded operation? No, that's a great way to characterize it, Faith, because this, uh, as I've heard from U.S. officials constantly, they reaffirm that this is an Israeli operation, um, that they have some guidance about what might be going on, but this is up to the Israelis to determine exactly what it is that they're going to be doing. So one of the things that I keep hearing here is that the uh, U.S. is monitoring the situation right now. We, they are aware of the Israelis' announcement. They are aware of the intensified bombing that we've seen today. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to ascertain is exactly what does this expansion of a ground operation actually mean? As Inez asked, is this really the operation, the, the big offensive that we've been waiting for? Or is it more this limited incursion that, that Martha Raddatz has heard about from a U.S. official? So here at the Pentagon, they're trying to determine exactly what is going on. Um, but uh, ultimately, they always say that this is an Israeli operation and that it will be up to them to announce exactly whether this is the big offensive that we've been anticipating.
And Mick, we want to lean into your expertise here. You know, as the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, you have extensive knowledge on that part of the world. So what can you tell us about, uh, you know, the growing fears there that this conflict could actually spread and become a wider conflict? So, Faith, I think that uh, that concern is valid, uh, quite frankly. You could see in all the reports of all the protests in neighboring countries, but also the one factor that's common in all these groups that are uh, attacking Israel right now is Iran. So Iran uh, supplies Hamas with military weaponry, guidance. They also do it with Hezbollah in Lebanon. And we can see that there's a big concern that they could join this fight. They have more military capacity than Hamas. That could be a significant issue for the IDF to then to be fighting a war on two fronts. Iran also uh, supports many militias in Syria, which could be another front, and also in the West Bank. Uh, so there is a big concern that Iran would orchestrate an all-out attack on Israel, and that is why the United States has prepositioned uh, military assets like the two uh, aircraft carrier strike groups right off the coast of Israel. So if it becomes uh, essentially required that the U.S. become involved, we will be prepared to do so. I don't think we want to. I'm sure we don't want to, but we, uh, we have prepared ourselves to be able to if that decision needs to be made. And Louis, you and our teams here have reported that, you know, U.S. Uh, forces are in that region. Uh, any indication at this point that they're basically changing their posture because of this expanded ground operation? Well, they're already at a very high a posture of faith uh, because of these attacks that have been taking place inside of Iraq and Syria, the ones that Mick was just talking about. Um, and so, yes, they have been already at a high level of force protection. And right now, I think uh, we're going to have to wait and see how this operation plays out. If, again, this uh, IDF announcement of uh, an expanded operation is, in fact, the offensive uh, that we've been waiting for. Um, but one of the things that Mick did mention really significantly there is the, the notion of self-defense for U.S. forces and also the, the presence of deterrence. Uh, those ships that have been sent there, those additional air defense systems that have been sent there to protect American forces, those systems are en route, and some of them are already there. Uh, so that's very key. So if you're going to maintain a high level of force protection as they are already, then it's an added benefit to have those systems in place right now. And Mick, it's going to be a difficult night for the families of the hostages who are in Gaza tonight. Um, there is this humanitarian crisis that's also growing there. Uh, just any comment or any any anything you can add to you know the idea that Hamas has made it clear that if Israel were to expand its ground operation, if there were any major incursion, that they would not release any more hostages. How does this? What Israel announced today, how does this change this? How does this make this more challenging going forward in terms of getting the hostages back? So, Faith, uh, hostage rescue operations, and I've been on a few, are very difficult, some of the most difficult in any combat operation. It would have been uh, the best scenario to get hostages out via diplomacy through Qatar, through the means that got the first four out. But I think uh, people are coming to the realization that Hamas is not going to release a lot of hostages. One, because they're going to use them as shields. They're also going to put them in the tunnels. If they put hostages in the tunnels, that creates an entirely different dilemma for the IDF. They can't just, you know, essentially destroy the tunnels. They have to go in uh, basically mile by mile, and there's 300 miles, and, and try to not only uh, fight Hamas, but recover the hostages. So I would say that even if this turns into the full-on ground invasion, part of the mission will be to still recover the hostages. It's not over. It would have been better if it was done prior to that. But I am sure that the U.S. is advising them on how to do this, and I am sure the IDF and their special operations will be tasked specifically to go find these hostages and recover them. And I know you and all of us here at ABC News will, of course, be updated on that and uh, uh, continue to see what uh, updates we can bring to our viewers here. Louis and Mick, thank you so much for joining us and for your insight. All right, it's been nearly three weeks since the Hamas attack on Israel appended so many lives. In tonight's prime preview, ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman introduces us to an Israeli mother who desperately prays for her son to come home. Take a listen. A 21-year-old son, Elmog, was at the Nova Music Festival when terror struck. He called home, panicked. 
He said, open TV. Uh, the army closed the party. There are rockets and shooting all over. I'm hiding. I don't know what's going on. I'll call you every half an hour. Mom, I love you. This and was the last phone call. The last phone call. When he said, I love you, did you know something serious was happening? Yes. And be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis coming up tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. Coming up for us here, the suspect behind that deadly mass shooting in Maine still on the run tonight. What we know about Robert Card, the suspect, and the massive manhunt underway to find him. That's straight ahead. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 20th. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. manhunt in Maine. We turn now to the growing manhunt in Maine. Officials holding a press conference just moments ago where they identified all 18 victims gunned down by accused killer Robert Card. A law enforcement agent saying they've expanded their search on land, water, and in the air. The commissioner of Maine's Department of Public Safety, Michael Sashik, saying officials have received immense help from the public so far. Yeah, so we have, again, uh, 530 plus uh, tips and leads that have come in. Um, some of those have been citing, some of those have been, um, it, and I would say as simple as, but hey, I've got a, a vacant house that's in this location. I own a barn that I'm afraid to go to. A shelter-in-place order has also been lifted as law enforcement agents map out where the suspect could possibly be his escape route. So they're looking into all of that. Officials turning their focus to the uh, local boat launch there. We want to bring in ABC News' Morgan Norwood, who's on the ground for us in Lewiston, Maine, and a former FBI special agent in charge, Rich Frankel. Uh, thank you both for joining me again this evening. Uh, Morgan, I want to start with you. Earlier, you talked about how the community members were starting to come out and come together to uplift uh, their fellow community members after this tragedy happened there. What else can you tell us about the shelter in place being lifted and you know they've been on edge now for nearly 48 hours and how they're feeling about this? 
Yeah, I can imagine that, Faith, there's some sort of relief. Of course, as you just said, uh, the shelter-in-place order has been rescinded. We actually just got the geofence alert on all of our iPhones just uh, a moment ago. But, of course, we know that hunting is prohibited in four towns. Still, they are asking the community to stay vigilant. But what this means for this community here in Lewiston is that they finally have an opportunity to grieve properly. We were talking about this with the lockdown. They haven't been able to emerge much. And earlier today, we showed you, um, you know, people starting to come and bring flowers. And we're actually seeing that now. That memorial, that sign uh, has now grown. There's more uh, flowers. There's more, uh, you know, cards as well. So, you know, this means that they can finally start to return to their normal lives. And obviously, officials recognize the need for that as well. And that in and of itself is healing as they try to, uh, you know, heal from, from this tragedy, Faith. And Rich, you know, officials there were sure to say that, you know, even though they're lifting the shelter in place order, that this crisis is not over. So based on what you heard during that press conference, do you think investigators are any closer to uh, getting the suspect? You know, I, I really don't. And um, not, not that, you know, uh, I feel for them, put it that way. Uh, this is a hard search to do. Um, you really just don't know where the gunman is. And so therefore, the search has to be as expansive as possible, but also directed into certain locations where you think he might be. Um, you know, until they have, you know, a sighting of some type, whether it's a camera that catches him, uh, somebody actually does see him, uh, this is going to be a multi-pronged search. It's going to be on the water because of the uh, belief that he may have had a boat. It's going to be in the area of Lisbon and Lewiston because they believe that he had a car. Um, it also is on foot because he may have just started, uh, you know, uh, walking, you know, away. He may have gotten a hitch, you know, hitched a ride. Um, and they have to look at all areas. He may, uh, you know, have gone for the border uh, with Canada. He may have gone for the border with New Hampshire. He may actually be trying to hide, you know, um, you know, kind of just in the city you know, walking through the city. He may change his appearance a little bit and just try to blend in, whether it's in, you know, Portland or Bangor or some other uh, community within uh, that area. So the the search is going to be um, just ever expanding. And I don't see that uh, easing off until they've got some indication where he might be. And then, of course, uh, until they actually catch this guy, because um, until he's caught, he's considered very armed and dangerous, and uh, they, they have no choice but to run down every lead. And, of course, that's what they said they will be doing this weekend. The headlines out of that news conference, the shelter-in-place order has been lifted, the search for the suspect continues, and, of course, the victims, all of them, have now been identified. Morgan Norwood, Rich Frankel, thank you both for joining me. All right, coming up for us here, the deadly mass shooting in Maine and the suspect's history drawing more attention to the intersection of mental health and violence. We'll talk about that after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 
America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Mola Lenghi in Beirut, Lebanon, and wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. The deadly mass shooting in Maine this week has, of course, drawn attention to mental health in this country. And of course, lots of lots of conversations happening in households all across the country. We want to bring in ABC News medical contributor and pediatrician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, to talk more about this, of course, as it's still top of mind. Uh, Dr. Patel, uh, officials in Maine have acknowledged that they're looking into the mental health of the shooter here, the suspect here. What can you tell us about, you know, mental illness and violence? Of course, not everyone who has mental illness goes on to commit any kind of violence, but it's important here because of what officials have said. So what can you tell us about the intersection of those two? Faith, it is important that officials look into the background of the shooter, trying to find any clues, but it's important to highlight something you said that a lot of people out there have mental illness, and it is an immoral and non-evidence-based equivalency to say people with mental illness are inherently violent. Given the fact that one out of five Americans has a diagnosable mental illness, that's about 60 million of us, and multiple research studies have shown that less than 10% of mass shootings involve severe mental illness. So this is not only an irresponsible generalization to make, it moves away from actually addressing the root problem, and it causes more stigmatization of mental illness, which we don't want to have, given the fact that it's such a looming issue for so many of us. And we've heard that from, of course, a lot of mental health uh, professionals as well. Uh, we've seen polling here at ABC News that shows that a majority of Americans have expressed confidence that, you know, mental health monitoring and treatment uh, would reduce gun violence in this country. But based on what you know, what can you tell us about the current state of mental health services in this country, the availability of it, the accessibility of it? Well, there's 60 million people out there who have a diagnosis of mental health condition. There's over 200 different types of mental health disorders. And the latest statistics show us that less than 50% of people who have a condition actually seek treatment or are able to get it. So between a sincere lack of services, awareness, and stigmas, not everyone who needs treatment is getting it right now. And this is a sincere public health issue. So it's important for people out there to reach out to a healthcare professional, try to find counseling. There's talk therapy, there's telemedicine. But at the first thing that anyone can do is just talk to someone about what you're going through. And speaking of talking, you talk to a lot of patients, uh, parents as a pediatrician, and I'm sure they express concerns about gun violence uh, in a lot of places across this country. What do you tell them to alleviate their fears or tell them what do they want to know? What do they want to know about gun violence or what should they know, I should say? The first thing that all of us should know, parents, guardians, pediatricians, healthcare professionals, journalists, is that gun violence is a leading cause of death for children and teens. That is just unacceptable. So we need to have the conversation not only about this public health issue, but about basic gun safety in this population in fact, here's an alarming reality. About a third of American children live in a house with a firearm, and of that, half of those firearms are unlocked, meaning they're easily accessible. And then here's a statistic that is just glaring. 80% of suicides in this population that involve a firearm involve a gun that was found in the victim, a family, relative, or friend's house. So safe gun storage for anyone out there who has a gun and has kids is a paramount conversation and measure that we should all be taking. Very important. And of course, it's been a very difficult week for all of us here across this country, especially in those communities who were impacted uh, by the shooting. Uh, it's Friday, of course. So what's your prescription for the weekend? I'll keep it. I'll keep it simple. Ask someone around you, how is your mental health? Simply ask them, non-judgment, offer an ear. And for anyone out there who may be going through a mental health crisis, remember 988 is available. Most important thing that we can all do is have compassion, hear out one another, and offer that non-judgment space for people to talk about what they're going through. 
And Dr. Patel, we will take that advice. Thank you so much for joining us here. And again, you at home, if you know someone who's struggling with thoughts of suicide, uh, there's free confidential help that's available to you 24 hours a day. It's available to everyone seven days a week. You can call or text that national lifeline number. Again, that's 988. I'm Faith Abube. Coming up at 7 o'clock Eastern Time right here on ABC News Live. Be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact that they have on you. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Tonight, the victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all. Hello to you, I'm Faith Abube. Thanks for joining us here on ABC News Live. We begin with breaking news in the Middle East. Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, says it's expanding its ground operations in Gaza tonight. A military spokesperson there saying the troops will be, quote, acting with great force to achieve the objective objectives of the war. This news coming after Israeli authorities say Hamas launched a missile that struck an apartment building in Tel Aviv, injuring at least four people. Israeli troops also conducted a second night of raids in Gaza this week, targeting Hamas infrastructure and tanks and airstrikes. And today, White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said the U.S. is not drawing red lines for Israel in its operations as active negotiations to release hostages are still ongoing. We know the death toll is rising on both sides of this conflict at this point. Officials in Israel say more than 1,400 people have been killed from the Hamas terror attacks that happened earlier this month in Israel. While the Hamas-controlled health ministry reports more than 7,000 people have been killed so far in Gaza from Israeli airstrikes. Meantime, the United Nations warning that Gaza is on the brink of collapse as its humanitarian crisis worsens by the day. Protests are continuing in support of the people in Gaza. This video showing you thousands of Jordanians protesting in Amman today, calling for the termination of a peace treaty with Israel. Let's take you live now uh, to the Israeli-Gaza border. You see the live picture there, mounting concerns tonight as the war continues and intensifies. Concerns about whether this will become a wider conflict and grow into a wider conflict. ABC News' Inez de la Cotera joins me now from Jerusalem to talk more about this expanded ground operation that is happening tonight, according to Israeli forces. Uh, Israel, uh, Inez, I, I just want to talk about the, the family members right now. You know, the American hostages who are being held in Gaza, they met with uh, Vice President Kamala Harris tonight. What is this latest development, this ground operation, this expanded ground operation that uh, the IDF announced? What does this mean for these hostages and their safety? 
Yeah, lots of concerns about what this could mean for those hostages. So we do know that the families of some of these American hostages uh, met with the Vice President Kamala Harris today. We know a representative for these families says they were not informed of this expanded ground incursion. But we know that the fact that there are hostages inside of Gaza has complicated this whole situation. It is part of the reason that the IDF appeared to be delaying its big ground invasion. And we should be clear that we're not sure that what's happening right now is this big ground invasion uh, that we've been waiting for. Um, but certainly the fact that there were hostages in Gaza complicated things. We know that uh, there, there, we had reporting that the U.S. was uh, asking privately for uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to delay the ground invasion so as to buy more time to negotiate these hostages release. We've seen protests here around Israel, families of the hostages uh, calling for the ground invasion to be delayed, worried about the safety of their hostages. So, um, you know, unclear if what we're seeing now, if it's if it is this big ground invasion, or if it's a more limited incursion, uh, a uh, senior U.S. official telling our Martha Raddatz that that is the case, that this is the Israelis launching a limited uh, incursion. And if that's the case, then the big question is, is this the Israelis kind of changing their strategy here because of the hostages? Are they going to decide to just go in and, and conduct these small raids that we've been seeing, you know, conducted over the last few days? Or is this really this big ground invasion? Unclear. But yeah, lots of concerns for those hostages. And of course, Israel has been adamant that this is about destroying Hamas. Uh, we heard from the White House today that, you know, the remarks about not drawing red lines for Israel, all of this, of course, happening uh, as we, this news is happening this afternoon, uh, this expanded ground invasion or ground, uh, uh, expanded ground operation, uh, according to the IDF. Now, have you been hearing any reaction uh, to all of this from the Arab world, the leaders in the neighboring countries there? Yeah, we're starting to see some protests or calls for protests already, specifically in Jordan. And you mentioned it off the top there. We saw thousands taking to the streets there earlier today. And there were calls uh, specifically in Jordan uh, for protests to be held outside of the Israeli embassy. We've seen across the Arab world lots of reaction to the strikes on Gaza. And we should point out uh, that the IDF is also ramping up its airstrikes on Gaza tonight in addition to this expanded ground operation. And so lots of concerns for the civilians of Gaza. We also know that the civilians have now officially lost communications. A number of aid uh, groups are saying that they have lost contact with their workers on the ground in Gaza. And so you can imagine the situation that civilians now find themselves in uh, just hearing these these airstrikes and these explosions and not being able to really know what's going on. Um, you know, people in Gaza we had been speaking with in, in recent days had, had already talked about how it was difficult to access the news and to know what was going on because of the siege that's being laid to Gaza, the fact that there's no uh, electricity, no fuel. Um, but now they, they've you know, officially cut um, uh, comms, so so no internet, no no phone services, um, and so I think we are going to see reaction there in, in the Arab world in the coming days. Uh, people, you know, uh, uh, protesting these these ramped up airstrikes, the uh, expanded ground operation, and the fact that civilians can no longer share their story with the outside world. And for now, so a long night for so many in that region. Ines, thank you so much for your reporting. All right, so for more now on the Israel-Hamas war, I want to bring in ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, who's at the Pentagon for us, and ABC News national security and defense analyst uh, Mick Mulroy. And Louis, I just want to start with you about what your sources are telling you. I know the Pentagon is getting this, you know, uh, wide view of what's going on. They're letting the Israeli forces uh, basically decide what they want and not getting, you know, personally involved there. But what are they telling you right now about this expanded operation? No, that's a great way to characterize it, Faith, because this, uh, as I've heard from U.S. officials constantly, they reaffirm that this is an Israeli operation, um, that they have some guidance about what might be going on, but this is up to the Israelis to determine exactly what it is that they're going to be doing. So one of the things that I keep hearing here is that the uh, U.S. is monitoring the situation right now. We, they are aware of the Israelis' announcement. They are aware of the intensified bombing that we've seen today. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to ascertain is exactly what does this expansion of a ground operation actually mean? As Inez asked, is this really the operation, the, the big offensive that we've been waiting for? Or is it more this limited incursion that Martha Raddatz has heard about from a U.S. official? So here at the Pentagon, they're trying to determine exactly what is going on. Um, but ultimately, they always say that this is an Israeli operation and that it will be up to them to announce exactly whether this is the big offensive that we've been anticipating. 
And Mick, we want to lean into your expertise here. You know, as the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, you have extensive knowledge on that part of the world. So what can you tell us about, uh, you know, the growing fears there that this conflict could actually spread and become a wider conflict? So Faith, I think that uh, that concern is valid, uh, quite frankly. You could see in all the reports of all the protests in neighboring countries, but also the one factor that's common in all these groups that are uh, attacking Israel right now is Iran. So Iran uh, supplies Hamas with military weaponry, guidance. They also do it with Hezbollah in Lebanon. And we can see that there's a big concern that they could join this fight. They have more military capacity than Hamas. That could be a significant issue for the IDF to then to be fighting a war on two fronts. Iran also uh, supports many militias in Syria, which could be another front, and also in the West Bank. Uh, so there is a big concern that Iran would orchestrate an all-out attack on Israel, and that is why the United States has prepositioned uh, military assets like the two uh, aircraft carrier strike groups right off the coast of Israel. So if it becomes uh, essentially required that the U.S. become involved, we will be prepared to do so. I don't think we want to. I'm sure we don't want to, but we, uh, we have prepared ourselves to be able to if that decision needs to be made. And Louis, you and our teams here have reported that, you know, U.S. Uh, forces are in that region. Uh, any indication at this point that they're basically changing their posture because of this expanded ground operation? Well, they're already at a very high a posture, Faith, uh, because of these attacks that have been taking place inside of Iraq and Syria, the ones that Mick was just talking about. Um, and so, yes, they have been already at a high level of force protection. And right now, I think uh, we're going to have to wait and see how this operation plays out. If, again, this uh, IDF announcement of uh, an expanded operation is, in fact, the offensive uh, that we've been waiting for. Um, but one of the things that Mick did mention really significantly there is the the notion of self-defense for u.s forces and also the, the presence of deterrence uh, those ships that have been sent there, those additional air defense systems that have been sent there to protect American forces, those systems are en route, and some of them are already there. Uh, so that's very key. So if you're going to maintain a high level of force protection as they are already, then it's an added benefit to have those systems in place right now. And Mick, it's going to be a difficult night for the families of the hostages who are in Gaza tonight. Um, there's this humanitarian crisis that's also growing there. Uh, just any comment or any, any, anything you can add to you know, the idea that Hamas has made it clear that if Israel were to expand its ground operation, if there were any major incursion, that they would not release any more hostages. How does this what Israel announced today, how does this change this? How does this make this more challenging going forward in terms of getting the hostages back? So Faith, uh, hostage rescue operations, and I've been on a few, are very difficult. Some of the most difficult in any combat operation. It would have been uh, the best scenario to get hostages out via diplomacy through Qatar, through the means that got the first four out. But I think uh, people are coming to the realization that Hamas is not going to release a lot of hostages. One, because they're going to use them as shields. They're also going to put them in the tunnels. If they put hostages in the tunnels, that creates an entirely different dilemma for the IDF. They can't just, you know, essentially destroy the tunnels. They have to go in uh, basically mile by mile, and there's 300 miles, and, and try to not only uh, fight Hamas, but recover the hostages. So I would say that even if this turns into the full-on ground invasion, part of the mission will be to still recover the hostages. It's not over. It would have been better if it was done prior to that. But I am sure that the U.S. is advising them on how to do this. And I am sure the IDF and their special operations will be tasked specifically to go find these hostages and recover them. And I know you and all of us here at ABC News will, of course, be updated on that and uh, continue to see what updates we can bring to our viewers here. Louie and Mick, thank you so much for joining us and for your insight. All right, it's been nearly three weeks since the Hamas attack on Israel appended so many lives. In tonight's prime preview, ABC's foreign correspondent James Longman introduces us to an Israeli mother who desperately prays for her son to come home. Take a listen. Her 21-year-old son, Elmog, was at the Nova Music Festival when terror struck. 
He called home, panicked. He said, open TV. Uh, the army closed the party. There are rockets and shooting all over. I'm hiding. I don't know what's going on. I'll call you every half an hour. Mom, I love you. This and was the last phone call. The last phone call. When he said, I love you, did you know something serious was happening? Yes. And be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis coming up tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. Coming up for us here, the suspect behind that deadly mass shooting in Maine still on the run tonight. What we know about Robert Card, the suspect, and the massive manhunt underway to find him. That's straight ahead. We'll be right back. Tonight, the victims of the massacre in Maine and the investigation. Plus, as the death toll rises in Gaza, the world braces for an Israeli ground invasion. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. So I got a bunch of new pieces on she Shein. 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 This company just seemed to come out of nowhere. Shein's tapping into our urge to consume and express ourselves. I spent $500 as Shein. Calling out a big company is scary. What makes Shein so different is that. Unboxing Shein. This is Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. We turn now to the growing manhunt in Maine. Officials holding a press conference just moments ago where they identified all 18 victims gunned down by accused killer Robert Card. A law enforcement agent saying they've expanded their search on land, water, and in the air. The commissioner of Maine's Department of Public Safety, Michael Sushik, saying officials have received immense help from the public so far. Yeah, so we have, again, uh, 530 plus uh, tips and leads that have come in. Um, some of those have been citing, some of those have been, um, it, and I would say as simple as, but hey, I've got a, a vacant house that's in this location. I own a barn that I'm afraid to go to. And that shelter in place order has also been lifted as law enforcement agents map out where the suspect could possibly be his escape route. They're looking into all of that. Officials turning their focus to the uh, local boat launch there. We want to bring in ABC News' Morgan Norwood, who's on the ground for us in Lewiston, Maine, and a former FBI special agent in charge, Rich Frankel. Uh, thank you both for joining me again this evening. Uh, Morgan, I want to start with you. Earlier, you talked about how the community members were starting to come out and come 
come together to uplift uh, their fellow community members after this tragedy happened there. What else can you tell us about the shelter in place being lifted? And, you know, they've been on edge now for nearly 48 hours and how they're feeling about this. Yeah, I can imagine that, Faith, there's some sort of relief. Of course, as you just said, uh, the shelter-in-place order has been rescinded. We actually just got the geofence alert on all of our iPhones just uh, a moment ago. But, of course, we know that hunting is prohibited in four towns. Still, they are asking the community to stay vigilant. But what this means for this community here in Lewiston is that they finally have an opportunity to grieve properly. We were talking about this with the lockdown. They haven't been able to emerge much. And earlier today, we showed you, um, you know, people starting to come and bring flowers. We're actually seeing that now, that memorial that sign uh, has now grown there's more uh, flowers there's more uh, you know cards as well so you know this means that they can finally start to return to their normal lives and obviously officials recognize the need for that as well and that in and of itself is healing as they try to uh, you know heal from from this tragedy faith and rich you know officials there were sure to say that you know even though they're lifting the shelter in place order that this crisis is not over so based on what you heard during that press conference do you think investigators are any closer to uh, getting the suspect you know i i really don't and um not not that you know uh i feel for them put it that way uh this is a hard search to do um you really just don't know where the gunman is. And so therefore, the search has to be as expansive as possible, but also directed into certain locations where you think he might be. Um, you know, until they have, you know, a sighting of some type, whether it's a camera that catches him, uh, somebody actually does see him, uh, this is going to be a multi-pronged search. It's going to be on the water because of the uh, belief that he may have had a boat. It's going to be in the area of Lisbon and Lewiston because they believe that he had a car. 